here. Before we launch into our panels, we just wanted to take a moment uh, to give a tribute to Sarah Ann Johnson. Sarah was a dedicated member of our community here at CRAB, inspiring us all with her brilliant mind, open heart, and unrelenting positivity. I actually met her as a grad student when she was a grad student as well. Um, I, we sat next to each other on a plane. We were going to the neuroscience conference and we started talking about our research. And I said, I'm doing a PhD with Dr. Brenda Galley. And she turned to me, she said, Brenda was my doctor. And so we remained in contact all those years she had bilateral retinoblastoma, but two years ago today, she passed away. And we remember her for all that she did for the retinoblastoma community, as well as for the scientific community. She was an assistant professor of neuroscience at Rosalind Franklin University in Chicago. She was an avid champion of research and dedicated to retinoblastoma survivor follow-up in particular, and second cancer screening, which are two of our priorities here in this group. And we're gonna be talking about today and what we're gonna to do to, um, to, to meet that challenge and honor Sarah's legacy as well. So just so you know, in Canada, through the International Retinoblastoma Consortium, funds can be uh, donated to the Sarah Looks Forward Fund, the Sarah Looks Forward, the Dr. Sarah Ann Johnson Memorial Funds. So if you'd like more information, that's on our website or speak to any of us um, uh, during the break. So now I'll introduce Ivana to tell us all about our multidisciplinary panel discussions coming up. Thanks. Thank you. So we're at our panel session now. Uh, we have four panels for you today. We have a priority two, second cancer screening, priority five, new treatments, um, then we will have an Ask the Experts panel, which was one of our um, most uh, requested uh, items for our symposium from our attendees, and then a priority for follow-up and follow-through panel. So each session will be about 30 minutes, uh, and you will have a chance to do Q&A at the end. So I would like to invite our first um, panels, panelists up here, priority two, second cancer screening, and Roxanne, I invite you to uh, introduce your panel. Yep. Uh, Trevor and Stephanie, if you'd like to join me, thank you. So we're starting off with our panel uh, dedicated to priority number two, second cancer screening. Um, and so priority two asks what second cancer screening is optimal for heritable retinoblastoma survivors? Uh, so approximately 45% of retinoblastoma patients have the heritable form of RB. And this, as you know, has a risk of second cancers uh, later in life. Uh, and so, in order to diagnose second cancers early, we need effective screening protocols, um, and those protocols need to be evaluated for effectiveness. So um, we gather three great panelists here. Um, Dr. Trevor Pugh is a senior investigator and director of genomics at the Ontario Institute of Cancer Research, associate professor at the University of Toronto, senior scientist at Princess Margaret Cancer Center, and the Canada Research Chair in Translational Genomics. He's a cancer genomics researcher and a board certified molecular geneticist whose research program is focused on understanding the clinical implications of mutations in cell populations and tumors during treatment. We also have Stephanie Kletke, who is a pediatric ophthalmologist in the retinoblastoma program here at SickKids and also assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, Stephanie's clinical research uh, interests include novel therapies in retinoblastoma evaluation of treatment outcomes, and second cancer surveillance in heritable RB. And virtually, we have Mary Connolly Wilson, who is joining us from St. John's, Newfoundland. Um, as a retired nurse and genetic counselor, she has a broad experience in healthcare delivery, program development, and genetic education and counseling. Um, Mary was the, one of the founders of the Canadian Association of Genetic Counselors and served in many key roles for 25 years. Um, Mary also has lived experience uh, 
of retinoblastoma with memory members of her family affected by RB. So first I'm gonna invite Trevor to give his presentation. Should be pretty safe over here by myself. Great, so thanks very much for inviting me to speak today. I'm gonna to talk about uh, an actual uh, pan hereditary cancer program that we've uh, been running actually for the last five years uh, here in Canada called CHARM. And we've actually just had our first success story in uh, Lee from any syndrome, so P53 carriers. I'm gonna show some of that data using cell-free DNA floating in blood to really pick up that very, very earliest indication of first cancer, second cancer, and potentially uh, not just individual cancer types, but any cancer that individuals may be at risk for. Uh, and this has really been a, a great collaboration um, led by uh, postdocs, Derek Wong and Ping Lo in the lab, uh, but also in collaboration with uh, Raymond Kim looking at um, the adult population at Princess Margaret and David Malkin uh, here at SickKids. And our website for Charm Consortium is right there. Um, so the whole concept is cell-free DNA. So it's now actually knowing that not just cancer cells, but every cell shed DNA into, uh, into the bloodstream. So everyone here has DNA flowing around in their blood. 99.9% .9 of it is just coming from normal healthy cells. And what we're looking for using this new DNA sequencing technology is any hint of uh, uh, free-floating uh, DNA that are coming from cancer cells. So the point of this slide is just showing all the many ways that cells can shed either DNA into blood. And we want to use these new technologies to find cancer-specific cell for DNA. Uh, so this idea of finding uh, cancer-derived DNA is what we built CHARM all around. Uh, so CHARM has been actually operating since 2018. Um, and the philosophy was anyone at high risk for cancer uh, could enroll. And we had directed funding for hereditary breast cancer, uh, neurofibromatosis, Lynch syndrome, and, um, and Lee-Fermin syndrome. So these are all the genetics clinics across the country that are currently and actively are recruiting patients. And so far we've blanked over 2000 blood samples from 1600 patients from across the country. And we built the whole consortium around these three pillars, one around the clinical experience. So uh, how do we bank samples? Very logistically complex. Um, the part I'm gonna talk about, which is genomes, um, genome technology assessment. How do we find cell-free DNA? And Yvonne Bombard's group uh, really looking at what, is, what are these technologies going to look like in practice? How do we take them from research and make them more broadly available if they're working well in the research uh, arena? Uh, so here's some data from our, our P53 cohort. Uh, so we sequenced nearly 100 uh, cell-free DNA samples from carriers with P53. Some of them had an active cancer diagnosis. Some of them had never had cancer. Um, so cancer positive, these are the individuals who, who had an active cancer diagnosis. Cancer negatives were individuals who had never had cancer or had a cancer who, that was successfully treated. And here we were just looking for secondary P53 mutations. So these individuals carry P53 and we know that their cancers have a second hit. And indeed, and the way to read this, each column here is a, a, different, uh, a different participant in the study. And what we found was we found lots of P secondary P53 mutations in the cell for DNA of individuals with a cancer, um, the cancer diagnosis. But surprising to me was how many individuals we actually found cell-free DNA from people who were actually clinically negative. And this was our first sign that, yes, this technology is likely to be able to find something before detection of disease. The other surprising part we here was, how come we didn't find mutations in everybody who had a cancer diagnosis? And this is because some of the tumors that are encountered in Lee for many syndrome are extremely- <laughs> oh, are, are extremely- mutation and hockey analogy was to be extremely precise and try to pick out that one mutation in P53. And our thinking across CHARM, especially as we broadened away from Lee Fermeni into everybody who's at high risk for cancer, is to throw as many pucks on that as possible. Sequence the entire genome and look for the th tens of thousands of mutations that are actually highly specific to cancer cells. The other benefit of going to whole genome sequencing is it's operationally much easier. We can sequence everybody uh, simultaneously but it also lets us find other alterations associated with cancer, such as copy number variants. 
So this is a, a chromosome readout from two individuals, both P53 carriers. So the chromosome numbers are here along the bottom, totally different cancer types. So they carry P53, but they're at risk for uh, many different uh, cancer types. This technology, since we've gone across the whole genome, lets you find very uh, simple genomes, just a single copy number change in this Ewing sarcoma, or extremely complex cancer genomes, like in this, uh, in this case, actually a late stage uh, prostate cancer, but really moving to an unbiased approach to detect any type of cancer using cell-free DNA. And the third technology we use in addition to mutations and copy number changes are methylation changes as well. So in this case, a lot of our leaf romani syndrome uh, patients were at high risk or had breast cancer. So we built a specific classifier for chemical modifications on DNA that were highly specific to breast cancer. And in fact, we're able to, and this red line is sort of our threshold. So in this case, we were able to find all breast cancers in individuals who had an active breast cancer diagnosis marked here in, in purple. This little exclamation point, this is the, uh, the same prostate cancer uh, case, but still scored extremely highly for breast cancer. And this is actually a unique feature of that particular tumor that also had this chemical, this unusual chemical mark across the entire genome. So it turned out to be a very uh, unusual type of tumor, but a very interesting uh, false positive in that case. Uh, the other um, finding, just like with mutations, we're able to find early cancer in individuals who are clinically negative, but we're able to find that disease early. And we had an un, uh, unexpected finding, even one of our healthy controls actually uh, scored higher than we, uh, than we expected. They didn't have cancer, but it does suggest there is a relatively high false positive rate with these methods, which actually still makes it a good screening method. If you're negative, if you do have a negative result, we don't find cell for DNA, you're very likely cancer free. But when you find something, you do need a secondary follow-up study. You can't just rely on a blood test uh, alone. And I just wanted to finish with an example we just actually got this data last week uh, where we um, individuals with leaf any syndrome come in every six months for a whole body MRI. Uh, so we had some patients since we started in 2018 who have been with us for a long time and been uh, providing blood samples. So here's just the readouts from two of those technologies, the methylation score and that copy number uh, track I showed, both of them below the threshold. So cancer-free and the imaging certainly um, up to this gray line um, recapitulated that they had no cancer at all. Uh, but then we collected two additional blood samples. And actually we did find that P53 mutation in the second blood sample and the copy number track actually found it in the first blood sample as well. So we had that sort of first indication that there may be a malignancy uh, developing. And in fact, by the time their next uh, whole body MRI came in, they actually had a, a, a well-developed uh, leukemia. And we did also see that of course, and you could see this trajectory uh, using the, this, uh, this copy number technology. So really the opportunity for blood, uh, blood, for blood testing where you can do this much more often than you can by imaging. And also you can access it sort of in your community. You can go to a blood lab and potentially access these technologies. Uh, so this is extremely new. I said, we just got this data uh, essentially last week, uh, but it really has given us um, some, some real confidence that this technology may have some clinical utility as well. On this is where CHARM is now. So we've recruited um, just under 1,600 patients, you can sort of see that effect of COVID had. We sort of had to shut down the trial, but we we're also able to ramp up very quickly because it was a blood-based protocol and uh, participants didn't necessarily have to travel into the hospital to participate in the study. And we're very keen to find funding to include as many hereditary cancer syndromes as we possibly can. And I'm very keen to work with uh, this community uh, to bring our retinal blastoma and partner uh, with CHARM. Uh, so thank you very much. That's uh, what Charm's all about. And uh, yeah, happy to take questions as part of the panel afterward. Turn to Stephanie. Would we have questions now or after? After. Okay. okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be discussing the role of self. <laughs> I'm going to keep my mask because I have a newborn at home. <laughs> Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. So I'm gonna be discussing the role of cell-free DNA um, uh, as a liquid biopsy for the detection of sucking cancers in heritable RB. So heritable retinoblastoma is an example of a familial cancer syndrome and the presence of a germline RB1 mutation predisposes to retinoblastoma and later in life um, is associated with a high risk of sucking cancers. Most commonly, these include osteosarcomas, soft tissue sarcoma, and melanomas. 
Um, in general, for individuals who have a cancer predisposition, it's important to have um, screening tests to detect cancers at an early stage. However, in retinoblastoma currently, there's no evidence-based screening guidelines for early detection. So we need a non-invasive method to detect second cancers early. Um, we know this is important because the staging of a cancer at diagnosis is a strong um, predictor of survival. So Dr. Pugh very nicely um, highlighted uh, what is cell-free DNA and this concept of a liquid biopsy. So how do we envision this playing a role for second cancer detection in retinoblastoma? Um, this would involve a non-invasive blood test that is repeated at regular intervals, and that would allow us to detect changes in the cell-free DNA signal over time. So if there was a cancer positive signal in the cell-free DNA, this would prompt further diagnostic testing to confirm whether there's uh, truly a cancer present. So this has the potential to identify cancers at a pre-symptomatic stage before the onset of symptoms um, and potentially enable earlier treatment. This is also well suited for second cancer screening because this is not specific to um, one type of cancer. We can screen for multiple cancers simultaneously to determine, um, uh, yes. Um, in terms of tissue of origin, so Dr. P was talking about the different assays involved uh, in their liquid biopsy. We have the potential to um, detect uh, the tissue of origin of a cancer, so where it's arising from. So if there was a positive tissue of origin signal in the cell-free DNA, then we could guide our diagnostic testing to be very targeted to look for that cancer. If the tissue of origin was not identified, then our diagnostic testing um, would be more broad-based, like a whole body MRI to look throughout uh, the body for a cancer. So what research questions do we need to answer in order to um, develop a test and then implement it clinically for heritable retinoblastoma? So first we need to validate a cell-free DNA-based assay. And this has already been beautifully um, accomplished by the CHARM group uh, led by Dr. Pugh, as he described. So their multimodal biopsy has been validated in, in four other familial cancer syndromes um, currently. The next step is really a prospective study in heritable retinoblastoma survivors across Canada. And this is where we're at right now in developing the protocol um, and seeking funding opportunities for this. So the purpose of this really is to determine the feasibility of the CHARM um, liquid biopsy approach in our patient population um, to detect early second cancers. So we're very excited to collaborate with the CHARM group um, and Dr. Pugh. Uh, this will really involve some collaboration with CRAB as well as we seek to recruit um, retinoblastoma survivors across Canada. So what will we want to um, accomplish with this study? First, we want to determine the detection rate of second cancers in our population. We also need to know other um, uh, parameters of this, the, the liquid biopsy assays. So for instance, as Dr. P was mentioning, the false positive and false negative rate. False positives refer to, you have a cell-free DNA signal of a cancer, um, but on subsequent diagnostic tests, there's, there's no evidence of a cancer. False negatives can occur in the setting of early cancers, um, whereby there might be an early cancer developing, but it's below the level, level um, of detection of the test. So the cell-free DNA test is, is negative. Um, positive and negative predictive value are related. So uh, having a high positive predictive value of the screening test means um, if you do have a positive cell-free DNA signal, it's highly likely that there is an underlying um, cancer and then limits of detection, as I mentioned. We also want to know in our patient population, how accurate is uh, the ability to detect the tissue of origin of the cancer um, through these types of assays. And then most importantly, um, what we aim to achieve here is um, an understanding of the acceptability of a surveillance protocol amongst retinoblastoma survivors. So to achieve that aim, we are going to establish a patient partner working group um, of individuals with lived experience to really better understand patient preferences um, and values when it comes to implementing a surveillance protocol uh, clinically. So if this does prove to be feasible in our patient population, the next step would be um, a larger clinical trial with more uh, retinoblastoma survivors across the country. And um, that will really help us achieve uh, a better understanding of whether this actually improves survival from early cancer detection. 
We also will want to better understand compliance with the protocol and uh, cost effectiveness of this type of surveillance strategy. So I'll just end with um, some other questions. There's a lot that we still need to learn through research. Um, how often do we do this blood-based test? What is a standard protocol for um, investigations following a positive cell-free DNA uh, screen? Can we use artificial intelligence to better understand cancer-specific uh, cell-free DNA profiles to guide understanding the tissue of origin? So um, this is really exciting, a lot still to learn, and we're very excited for the collaboration. Thank you. <laughs> Mary, if you could go ahead and share your slide. Okay, just uh, working on that now. It looks like uh, the other sh uh, screen is uh, still being shared. The other participant is still sharing. So it says I cannot uh, start my screen share while the other participant is sharing. Can you try again, Mary? Yep. Okay. So are you seeing it there now? Okay, so thank you for inviting me to uh, share my family and personal experience with retinoblastoma um, and the issues involving secondary cancer with you all today. Um, sorry. Okay, so I do have a very broad lived experience with uh, retinoblastoma. I have an uncle, two siblings, and eight cousins with RB, and I also have a personal diagnosis of a retinoma. Um, genetic testing revealed an RB1 mutation in affected relatives. Um, so um, this was back in uh, 1994. And there are 17 mutation positive individuals in our, in our family. Our family is actually considered a low penetrance family as not all individuals with the gene mutation go on to develop retinoblastoma. But it's important to note um, that in our family, all of these individuals who are mutation positive are at risk of secondary cancers, not just those who were clinically affected with RB as children. So um, the secondary cancer risks, and Stephanie just said some of those, so osteosarcoma, uh, melanoma, soft tissue car carcinomas, or sarcomas of the colon, stomach, and bladder, um, uh, the uterus as well, brain and, young, and lung. So the most significant of the secondary cancers in my family was actually my cousin, who was only a year older than me. He had unilateral uh, retinoblastoma as an infant, and he went on to um, have a melanoma of his shoulder at age 19 and a melanoma on his back at age 21. And he was not really aware before this that there was a risk of secondary cancer for himself and their relatives. And at, that, at the time of the melanoma diagnosis, it was not really explained how serious the diagnosis was at that time, and he didn't receive any follow-up. So at age 24, he was diagnosed with an astrocytoma, which is a brain cancer. He had surgery and that was followed by chemo and radiation. And then within a year, um, he had metastatic melanoma, um, which presented as an abdominal mass. And although he received chemo and radiation, he did die um, of this um, at age 28. And this was a truly defining moment for me um, on our family's RV journey. I realized that we were all at risk of secondary cancers um, and that I needed to take control of my health by being diligent um, and aware of my own risks. Um, other secondary cancers in my family, my grandfather had cancer of the spine uh, in his 40s. My maternal aunt who had a child with retinoblastoma um, had, uh, she was clinically unaffected herself, but she went on to have a bladder, bladder and uterine cancer in her 60s. 
And my uncle, um, who did have the mutation uh, in the RB gene, but wasn't affected clinically, um, he was also diagnosed with colon cancer in his 60s. So we have had, um, you know, other significant uh, secondary cancers in the family. So what can RB survivors do? We can keep abreast of new knowledge related to the risks and the prevention of secondary cancer. We can seek early medical attention for any unusual symptoms. And it, it's very important to inform healthcare providers about increased risk of secondary cancers. Um, retinoblastoma is still a rare disorder and many um, healthcare practitioners really don't have any idea about retinoblastoma and especially about the secondary cancer risk. So it's always valuable to have a family physician with knowledge of familial cancer as well. Um, screening recommendations, as Stephanie said, there's nothing um, really in stone uh, you know, for that, but what I guess most people try and follow, or at least I do, um, is ophthalmology appointment yearly um, to check on things. For those who've had chemo and radiation, it's important um, to have oncology follow-up. Uh, dermatology, yearly follow-up, um, early detection of uh, melanoma through screening and proper education can make this cancer easier to treat and increase chances of, of survival. Uh, for women, especially for secondary cancers, mammograms and uterine biopsies um, over the age of 40 or 50 um, would probably be recommended. Um, PSA, which is a blood test and a digital rectal exam for men um, over the age of 40 or 50. And screening colonoscopies are uh, basically, and fetal occult blood tests are recommended in the general population anyway, um, over 50. And um, colonoscopies uh, can detect polyps in the colon. And that means that they can be removed uh, before they become cancerous. So, all of those things are probably important for us all to do um, in terms of secondary cancer risk. Um, today, parents who have a child uh, with retinoblastoma receive genetic counseling. However, it's very important that those who have RB themselves seek genetic counseling themselves, either in their late teens or as young adults, to review their genetic testing results and to discuss their risks of passing um, on the gene mutation to their children. It's important to receive genetic counseling and prenatal education or, or, or prenatal testing during pregnancy uh, to determine whether the child has a mutation or not. And this information provides them with options during the pregnancy, and it also supports early diagnosis after birth. Um, it's also important to seek additional supports to address any other challenges uh, through support groups for retinoblastoma and young cancer um, survivor groups. Um, also, you know, staying in touch with things like CRAB um, and uh, being available for research opportunities, uh, those can all help. Cancer survivorship clinics would be the ideal way. Uh, to manage all the secondary cancer risks, as well as other concerns for survivors. But in Canada, that's not really ready, readily available to uh, most cancer survivors to date. Um, there are some cases in the States where they have those. So what can survivors really do? I think, um, and as you've heard from the first two speakers, it's important to take part in any available research. That will certainly help in the long run. And the most important thing is to be your own advocate. You are really the person in charge of your survivorship journey. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have time for two questions. I remind anyone, go ahead. Has denutrition been considered in this one? Because I understand you can get all this testing. What about considering diets and good nutrition to help the body improve or get a better um, chemistry?
Yeah, I think that's certainly important. And can you hear me on this? Um, that's certainly important and plays into what um, Mary was discussing with being an advocate for yourself and um, as a survivor doing anything possible to have a well-balanced um, and healthy lifestyle. Is it not on? <laughs> okay. So I'll just repeat the question was, um, what about the role of diet? Um, so I think certainly that's important and ties into everything else that Mary was discussing in terms of being an advocate for oneself and having a healthy lifestyle. Um, uh, but I think the screening technologies that uh, we're discussing will take that to the next, to the next level. We just have a question from a virtual participant. Maureen, are you able to unmute yourself to yeah. ask your question? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. So my question is um, about survivorship clinics. Um, I have been trying to get my husband in to a survivorship clinic in Alberta for <laughs> years. I've asked ophthalmologists. I've asked my family physician and anytime um, they've contacted Tom Baker Cancer Clinic, they said, oh no, he doesn't need to have um, follow-up. But I'm confused because I feel like um, my husband who is a survivor, um, bilateral, he's in his um, close to 60 now. And he had radi like radiation on his um, head. And um, I just feel like we're not being taken seriously by the healthcare system. So if I can just answer that, uh, you know, um, I've talked to many people here in Newfoundland about, um, you know, trying to set up survivorship clinics and that sort of thing. and. It really is a very difficult um, prospect. And for something like retinoblastoma, where it's a much rarer cancer, what I'm told is that really, it's kind of impossible to put us into one group. And um, it's, um, so what I have developed for at least, you know, myself here is um, a group of, of physicians who I see that are clearly aware of what my own needs are. Um, and they're, they, they say they're quite willing to take other retinoblastoma patients as well. So dermatology, you know, my ophthalmologist is very open to things. Um, for those in the cancer clinic who, you know, have gone through radiation and that sort of thing, um, you know, the, the cancer clinics usually are, um, open to seeing patients on, if not a regular yearly basis, at least, um, you know, when they feel uh, either through themselves or their own family physician that it's needed. So I think it's something, like I said, you're in charge of your own kind of journey. And I think for our population at this point, what we have to do is really try and advocate for ourselves and make sure that you surround yourself with physicians who really know your problem. Can I just add that um, I think the concept of a survivorship clinic is um, really something that we're striving towards and perhaps having this kind of liquid biopsy based platform can help us achieve that. Here at SickKids, um, at least the ophthalmology follow-up continues into adulthood, um, but if we could have some form of collaborative survivorship clinic at an adult center um, with both ophthalmology and oncology and all the other pieces, social work and such, genetic counseling. Um, that's really our dream, I think. So I hope we can move towards that. Okay, yeah. Like my daughter, who is also an RB survivor, she is, mm, we do have um, survivorship care for her through our children's hospital here in Alberta. Um, but it took us 
um, going a different route and going through our pediatrician instead of the eye, like the eye clinic for the survivorship because we couldn't, there was nothing happening that way. So just contacting my pediatrician and then my having my pediatrician referring us to the hospital um, was the route that we had to take, not through our ophthalmologist. So kind of, <laughs> it's, it's a confusing um, route to do. Like it's not a direct route to survivorship. I feel like it's a maze for me, my experience anyways. Thanks Stephanie, so much, Maureen. Stephanie, it's Catherine. Sure, Dr. Payton, you can go ahead. Yes, um, in British Columbia, we have been um, the grateful recipients of efforts by one of our um, nearly retired radiation oncology colleagues who was involved with these cases early. And we do have an adult survivorship clinic. Uh, we've got the same experience that it's a bit of an uphill battle uh, so one head of the cancer agency had to be persuaded that actually these children deserved an ongoing adult clinic later on in life. But we do have a program that is an you know, adult survivorship for retinal blastoma. So they are screened actively and kept track of through the BC Cancer Agency. Uh, there's a sort of significant guidance protocol that goes out that gets sent to a family doctor if the patient is lucky enough to have a family doctor and that targets what their treatments were as screening areas. So just to put this in the parking lot for activity, I would be pleased to help BC help other provinces get there. And I think if we do it as a national thing, the cell-free uh, cell DNA will certainly help. It may give people another um, approach, but there's lots of opportunity to do something useful and keep people in the system. And if there's more than one province doing it, then everybody else has to catch up. Thanks. Thank you. So I think we can continue some of this discussion later on in the panel on priority for follow-up. But for now, I'd just like to thank all of our panelists, Mary, uh, Trevor, and Stephanie for participating here. Thank you. Okay, I'm just looking for, okay, we're ready for our next panel. So thank you guys so much for starting off our panel session. Next, I will call on priority number five, new treatments. And Sam, if you could please come up here and introduce your panel. For all the speakers, if I could just direct you to our timekeeper in this corner, uh, there will be a card raised when we're near out of time. <laughs> Fantastic. So hello everyone, my name is uh, Sam Soroka. The panel I'm moderating is discussing retinoblastoma research priority number five, uh, known as new treatments. This priority involves developing high quality collaborative research to evaluate retinoblastoma treatments that will help us gain a better understanding of the current and new treatment methods and how they will impact tumor growth, vision, quality of life, patient outcomes, and patient safety. Presenting on my panel is Helen Damaris. Helen Damaris is a scientist uh, and associate professor at the University of Toronto. Much of her research is focused on how to deliver optimal retinoblastoma care worldwide and improve patient outcomes. 
Next is Furquan Sheikh. Uh, Furquan Sheikh is a pediatric oncologist in the solid tumor program within the division of hematology slash oncology at the Hospital for Sick Children. He is also an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Toronto. Next is Brenda Galley. Brenda Galley is an ophthalmologist at the uh, Hospital for Sick Children, pediatric ocular oncologist at the Alberta Children's Hospital, and professor at the University of Toronto. Brenda Galley's research has improved outcomes for children affected by retinoblastoma worldwide. Finally, I'd like to introduce Jillian Purdy. Jillian Purdy is a parent of a child with retinoblastoma. Jillian is a new member of the retinoblastoma community and is actually our most recent cup of tea patient guest speaker, where she presented her plain language summary of the article titled, Patients with Retinoblastoma and Chromosome 13Q Deletions Have Increased Chemotherapy-Related Toxicities. I would now invite uh, Helen Damaris uh, to start off our presentation. Thanks, Sam. So I'm going to introduce two studies today that uh, all of you are invited to participate in or partner on. Starting first with uh, the rare pediatric eye cancer biobank. And so for this, I just want to introduce to you all the concept of what a biobank is. You'll notice that the title is rare pediatric eye cancer. So that includes retinoblastoma, but there's a lot more eye cancers that kids get that are even more rare than retinoblastoma, if you can believe that. And so what we're trying to do is de develop a biobank. And that's the center image here. A biobank essentially is a collection of human tissues, of clinical data, of images that are held and stored in a way that preserves their integrity so that they are stored safely, securely, um, in good enough condition that high quality research can happen. Uh, using those, uh, those resources. And in order to do that, we have um, scientists, data managers um, who manage all those resources. That biobank, however, can't exist without patient families. And so that's why in this image, the first image is that image of patient families. Patient families are who own those tissues, who own that data, all those images taken for clinical care, and so it's only with permission from those families that through your, your circle of care, your clinicians, your medical doctors, you can, if you'd like, offer those tissues, those, um, that data, those images for research to be conducted. And that's essentially what we're doing. We're developing a patient partner biobank. Um, many of you will have participated in research throughout your history and maybe even provided some clinical data or tissues in the past. What we're trying to do is streamline the process so we can keep doing this in ways that are consistent with current standards for biobanking and in ways that we can share uh, all those important resources because this retinoblastoma is rare and the other eye cancers are even more rare, that we're really working together to share those um, resources for the most highly impactful studies. And so over on the other end of this image, you'll see images showing different kinds of research that can happen. So study of those specimens, that DNA, those images, um, and those decisions on who gets to do that research and what kind of research will happen through us working together collaboratively, patient families, medical doctors, scientists, to decide how we're gonna use those um, specimens, research, sorry, data and images, and in what kind of studies. And through um, CRAB, we can make those decisions and we have a mechanism to speak to each other. We've already set our top 10 priorities. We know that new treatments is the number five priority. And in order to achieve that, having these resources available to researchers, to researchers who include patients as members of their research teams can be possible. So happy to take questions on that. And just a little plug that we are looking for patient advisors to help develop this biobank. We have um, some members of our retinoblastoma community who've already joined. Um, if you're interested, please speak to me. Um, and we're also going to use our experience with patient engagement in retinoblastoma to go beyond retinoblastoma and involve people affected by other types of rare eye cancers. And your experience and your knowledge there will be key to helping those patient advisors help in this project. Second project I wanna give an update uh, on is called Riverboat for short. So that's research into visual endpoints and RB health outcomes after treatment. This is a study that's actually led by our friends at the university, Vanderbilt University uh, in the United States. 
And about 13 different North American hospitals are part of those, sick kids being one of those. Um, and essentially what this is looking at is looking at every retinoblastoma patient who, again, gives permission to be part of the study, um, who's had treatment from 2007 to 2024 with any type of therapy. So we're not testing anything here. It's an observational study. We're observing. We're seeing what happens to patients and seeing what happens to patients based on the type of therapy they got. This image here shows um, one part of the study where we're not just collecting clinical data, but we're asking uh, patients and parents and siblings to fill out questionnaires so we can see what's quality of life like, um, what is the out-of-pocket costs that are incurred when undergoing retinoblastoma treatment? And a part of the study, too, that people can participate in is to provide some DNA tissue so some genetic tests can be done. And so the image shows that up until today, the 13 centers have enrolled 363 patients um, and 105 siblings. So we're going to be comparing some of these outcomes with kids in the same families as kids with retinoblastoma. Um, because, you know, retinoblastoma is rare, there's another arm of the study that's just looking at clinical data, and this type of research can sometimes be done with a waiver of consent. So because the clinical data is sitting at the hospitals, um, these are just chart reviews, so we're supplementing the data from all the patient, parents, patients, and siblings who are participating with additional clinical data, and the images show how many patients have been accrued at each site. So you can see Toronto here, we have only, we're kind of behind, we only have 16 chart reviews there, but we have about 60 patients contributing overall to the 688 uh, patients. And so why is this important? We don't, we're not at the end of the study yet, but we're looking to see um, who's participating so far and do we have a representative sample? So the first table shows that, you know, we have about half male, half female. Our representation in terms of race is primarily white, but there's non-white races as well. Um, and uh, ethnicity is also represented um, for some of the, uh, uh, for either not Hispanic is the largest uh, group and Hispanic or Latino the other one. You'll notice that because it's an American study, these demographics are maybe not the way we describe things in Canada. And that's also another interesting reason why patients should be part of research to help us figure out how do we actually describe those things. Um, one interesting thing that's come out, it's preliminary data so far, is looking at what's vision like for patients who got intraarterial chemo versus patients who got uh, systemic chemo, uh, intravenous chemo. So there were 95 patients that were evaluable that had intraarterial chemo. So that's chemo um, uh, provided locally. Some of you, uh, your children may have received this. And intravenous chemotherapy, which comes in um, uh, th through the whole body, I guess, intravenously. And what you see is um, essentially uh, kids who, there's more kids with, who got intravenous chemo who have normal vision. Um, and yet there's more enucleations that happen in kids who get chemo. Whereas in IAC, we may be saving a lot of eyes, but vision, there's a lot more kids with vision problems. And so this is early, early data from the study, but also kind of interesting to see with new treatments, what are the effects? Is it important to save an eye? Is it important to save vision? Um, and what will actually be the case um, when you look at different hospitals around the world? This is all, uh, it's not clear how many of these kids are from. Toronto. So this is only some of the data that's coming out of the study. Many of you are part of this. Um, and um, as the study produces some more uh, data, we'll share it with you and ask for your feedback on how we're presenting it, what it means, and maybe some new questions we can ask based on your, uh, your, your input. So thank you. Next, I would like to invite for no, for crunching. Thank you, Samuel. Can everyone hear me? All right. I just want to start by saying that the quality of the symposium so far has been excellent. Thank you for inviting me. I've been asked to talk about the history, current state, and future directions of retinoblastoma treatment in five minutes or less, which is a bit of an impossible task. Uh, please pardon me. So I'm gonna speak quickly, but also touch on things very superficially. Um, let's start here. This is Dr. Alfred Knudsen. And in 1971, he published a paper using only mathematics, no test tubes, no cell lines, 
of his patients in the retinoblastoma clinic. And he hypothesized mathematically um, what we now know as the two hit hypothesis um, and that there would be something called a tumor suppressor gene that would need two knocks um, in order to develop tumor genesis. And this is just an early example of a discovery made in retinoblastoma that had a huge impact on the field of cancer care in general. Here's another example. This is a photo from 1957. This two-year-old is Gordon Isaacs, and he's the first patient, not just with retinoblastoma, but with cancer to receive external beam radiation therapy. He was facing the prospect of losing his last remaining eye. And a doctor in Stanford, Dr. Henry Kaplan, came up with this crazy idea to essentially modify a linear accelerator and target it at this patient's tumor. He succeeded in saving the eye. And the concept of technologies and treatments to, to help save at least one eye in retinoblastoma uh, was born. So radiation therapy started in 1957, uh, but for RB it ended in 1997 with the publication of this paper that definitively showed what people were observing, um, that those patients with germline retinoblastoma um, um, who received radiotherapy had more than a doubling of their second cancer risk, um, including the orbital osteosarcoma in the field of radiation. So as one era ended, another era began. That same year, uh, one issue of one journal, Archives of Ophthalmology, published four papers uh, on the use of systemic chemotherapy, intravenous chemotherapy based on carboplatin. You can see Dr. Galli, Dr. Budding, Dr. Chan, uh, and the kids group was one of these um, centers. And the editorial of that journal was called A New Era for the Treatment of Retinoblastoma because now um, eyes and lives could be saved with systemic chemotherapy, avoiding that exorbitant cost of second malignancies through external beam radiotherapy. And for the next, uh, but, but, but chemotherapy came of course with its own side effects, right? We know about the nausea, vomiting, hair loss, risk of infections, the need for a central line and the risk of hearing loss or ototoxicity. And so for the next decade, the next generation of research focused on ways to give chemotherapy more precisely to the eye and avoid those systemic side effects. We heard about intra-arterial chemotherapy. This was initially developed in Japan in the 1950s, but was reinvigorated in the 2000s by centers in New York. Um, and it's basically a catheter that's um, inserted directly into the ophthalmic artery and chemotherapy is delivered more precisely to the, the eye and the tumor. Uh, but of course it comes with its own side effects. We just saw some preliminary signals about does it affect the eye um, and the vision. Um, and most importantly, perhaps one of the contributions of the Sick Kids group has been to balance the hope and the hype uh, of IAC. Um, we remind people that IAC doesn't deliver any systemic uh, absorption of chemotherapy. And so for those patients who have potentially high-risk pathology, potentially micrometastatic disease um, are, are not being systemically treated with IAC. And so patient selection is of utmost importance. And we started using IAC at Sick Kids since 2017 with some good effects, but, uh, but we are very judicious in our patient treatments. Another way to give chemotherapy directly to the eyes with intravitreal chemo developed by our colleagues in Switzerland, worked on by one of our former fellows, uh, Dr. Solomon. Um, and this is very helpful for those um, eyes that have problematic vitreous seeding. Periocular chemotherapy was spearheaded again by our colleagues uh, in the room, Dr. Ashwin, Dr. Chan, and Damaris. Um, and this is the idea of giving chemotherapy just on the eye, outside the eye. And it was initially developed with this uh, sort of protein um, clot. Um, the results of this uh, series were moderate, but it laid the foundation, if you will, of newer vehicles with which to deliver periocular chemotherapy. And in particular, um, we're very excited to um, Dr. Gali is going to share some preliminary results of a clinical trial that we conducted on this device called a chemoplaque, a small silicone cup embedded with um, chemotherapy that diffuses into the eye gradually over a period of, of six weeks. Um, so we'll hear more about that exciting treatment. And then the next generation of breakthroughs, I think, will come not just from focusing on giving chemotherapy to the eye precisely, but giving precise chemotherapy. That is more targeted, molecularly directed um, innovations. Um, there's been successes uh, with targeted therapy, especially in leukemias and, and sarcomas, uh, but it's, um, it's based on understanding the molecular alterations and targeting specific genes and proteins at the, at the cellular level, at the nucleus level. Um, for example, a, protein, uh, a molecule called Nutlin-3 was recently tested for its ability to break up the interaction between P53, which we heard about in MDM2. Um, and while none of these therapies are yet in prime time, um, they are coming down the pipeline and the science has started. And we should expect to see um, hopefully some novel treatments in the next um, few years or decades. 
Another way to target um, things more specifically is immunotherapy. And we've heard about breakthroughs in immunotherapy from other cancers such as neuroblastoma or melanoma. And this is where drugs or antibodies or actually reprogrammed cells um, can be used to target specific proteins on the surface of cells. Uh, and because retinal blastoma shares some surface proteins such as GD2 with other cancers like neuroblastoma, it's possible that advances made in other cancers will, will trickle um, uh, down to the retinal blastoma patients as well. And, and the exact role of these compounds is yet to be determined. Um, but breakthroughs come not just from, from treatments, but also from better understandings. There's newer and newer staging systems. Once again, Dr. Ashwin, Dr. Brenda um, has um, spearheaded these efforts to develop a newer staging and predictive systems, such as the TNM 8th edition. Um, we've heard a lot today, and we'll hear some more about the concept of liquid biopsy. We heard about the cell-free DNA floating around in our blood. Uh, but Dr. Jesse Berry of CHLA um, is, uh, came up with this idea of also testing that cell-free DNA in the um, aqueous um, humor of the eye itself. So under an EUA with a very small needle, a little bit of uh, fluid from the anterior chamber of the eye can be collected and tested for those same um, cell-free DNAs. And what this really means is for the first time, we can do genetic testing on tumors, not just for those eyes that have been enucleated, but also those eyes that have not been enucleated. And one practical application of that is discovering newer molecular prognostic markers. So for example, in this paper, Dr. Berry's team showed that a chromosome change called 6P could actually be used to predict which tumors are more aggressive and more likely to be nucleated versus less aggressive, more likely to be uh, saved. And that information would be so handy upfront when decisions around enucleation versus uh, embarking on a course of um, chemotherapy uh, are being made. Similarly, these cell-free DNAs, as we've seen, can flow around the bloodstream, and they can also um, essentially transfer across the placenta from fetal blood to maternal blood, and that has the potential to become a new non-invasive prenatal diagnosis, um, a simpler, easier way, and safer way of determining um, genetic status of the fetus uh, compared to amniocentesis or villa sampling. And so I hope what I've shown very quickly is that retinal blastoma treatment is... Um, it's a, it's a packet, it's a, it's a box of tools and we like to use the right, uh, the right treatments for the right patients and it's ever expanding. Um, and in fact, what I would say, and I'm over time, but in closing very quickly, is that the, the pace and the impact of new discoveries and innovations in retroblastoma really exceeds what one would expect for a disease of, of this rarity um, or what one would see with other diseases of the same incidence. And I think that's really only due to the uh, incredible dedication and passion and, and mind sight of all of, of all the people, all the caregivers, the scientists, the patients and the families themselves. Um, so thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. You'll pull my slides up. So th thank you all for being here. And I want to thank Crab and all the members here and those watching online and those who couldn't be online for putting together this meeting and for pushing for all the things that Dr. Sheik just illustrated and the progress in retinal blastoma is due to the families and your input into all of this. So I get to talk about priority three in new treatments, the sustained release topotique and episcleral plaque, which the slides are not projecting. I can see the slide. <laughs> oh. um. There they go. Sorry. Thank you. So uh, um, I will continue and you can see the title of this um, um, study is step rb which is sustained release topotique and episcleral plaque for retinoblastoma and the a, a, the um, charities that have all made this possible to be run out of the hospital sick children are listed at the bottom so the company that manufactures this chemo plaque is 3t ophthalmics and they provide for this study the chemo plaques but they are not a rich development company because they're only working in rare retinoblastoma, which has trouble getting funds for anything um, because there aren't a lot of profits for the investors in retinoblastoma. And um, they provide the chemoplaques. 
So this is the little chemo pack that Firkin already showed you, and it's inserted at week zero. At 42 days later, the chemo plaque is removed, both of those under an EUA. It, each of those take about 20 minutes to do of the EUA time. So more of the time is consumed with all the pictures we take, as you all know. And uh, we score official study toxicity for 21 days at, till week nine, and then follow up for three years with proper rigor in uh, how to collect all that data. And the role of sick kids is the phase one clinical trial unit, make sure that we don't miss any data point and that everything's correctly placed in EPIC, the database, and every other details followed, which we really appreciate very much. So here I've illustrated the children that are currently on with this little um, snatched from crab image of this child. And you can see that there are three doses inside the chemo plaque, 0 0.6, 0 0.9, 1.2. And you can see the number of little children who are on it. And there are um, um, three of those that aren't evaluable. This is not working properly. I got my right talk up here anyway. Um, um, the, uh, um, we had toxicity, which is called dose limiting toxicity of scleritis in two out of the 22 evaluable patients. Although there's 25 on the study, only 20 two are evaluable because two of them didn't complete the full six weeks. And one of them is just too, too close only at week nine. So we can't score outcomes. So that's why I'm talking about outcomes for 22 patients. Um, there is uh, um, the uh, recurrence. In other words, they had a good response and then the tumor recurred in seven out of 22. And you can see those are illustrated with the R on top of the little child. And uh, it becomes evident in this graphic. I'm sorry, Terry, you can't see the graphic, but that the 0.6 dose is perhaps less effective than the 1.2 milligram dose. And you see there's two higher dose levels that we have not done at sick kids. Um, and they're being done in a, exactly the same trial, but running out of physics children. They're separate, both sponsored by the company providing the device and both run by, supported in the hospitals by charities. But um, they've had one major toxicity at the 1.5 milligram. And so we aren't willing to go further right now because of that event. There's sustained complete response in 15 out of the 22. And I'll show this in a different way here. This is, we call this a swimmer plot. It's a standard statistical way to measure outcomes from a, a point, a certain point by an intervention. So here at this point zero is the, where we compare all the treatments the eye with retinoblastoma may have gotten after the intervention, which is the chemo plaque in that little purple um, um, rectangle just before the week zero. So this comes as my favorite tool in all of retinoblastoma as a timeline, but it's a very different timeline that was developed by a summer student using Excel. And I'm very happy that Kelvin has taken over from Isabella in managing this because she's now a medical student and no time to look after the Excel file for me and Kelvin's improving it and making it better and better. So um, there are 25 participants you can see in the vertical axis, that's the 25. Each child has a, a bar that goes in gray out to the right side and the gray line is the date, is today's date. It ends where the today is. So you can see how long we followed each of these since the week zero intervention. So we're close to running up to three years for the first earliest um, participants in the study. And the Complete response, it's 15, not 14 out of 22, um, but the uh, complete response is shown where after the intervention, there's only a gray line. There's no other treatment indicated. You can see the yellow triangles are a nucleation. So there have been some eyes enucleated um, and that would not be a success of course, but some of those are, are enucleated not because of cancer recurrence, but because the eye was um, badly damaged by everything about it and not useful. So it was better to get rid of it. And so uh, this is a very useful way to look at it. What we need now is a whole new project to decide how do we get statistical numbers out of this data. Some of it's easy. They still have an eye. That's an easy thing to score. They don't have the cancer coming back. That's easy to score. And that would be complete remission. But what do those all those different treatments mean? 
that we needed to do to still save the eye. So all of that's new future research that's not, not funded. So I'll just end with one child. This is the first child in the world who had a chemo plaque. And you can see on the left side, he has already lost his left eye because you now know that a green, yellow triangle is removal of his left eye. And his right eye had had many systemic chemotherapies with the, because the line goes all the way through both eyes because the whole child received systemic chemotherapy. Whereas the intraarterial red triangle is only on the eye that received it while we're trying to save his right eye. And after all those treatments, this is what his retina looked like. And in the retinal drawing, which is the most useful thing, all the yellow is active retinoblastoma. His primary tumor, his main tumor has the blue calcium in the center and yellow rim, but then there's more than 30 little tiny tumors in yellow everywhere. And we would laser those and laser those and they'd come back the next time. So we could not succeed in saving his only eye without external beam radiation and its long-term consequences or removing his good vision eye. So we put in a chemo, going back, we put in a chemo plaque after I learned from Lynn Murphy that this was finally approved by FDA in the US to put one of these in a human. I spent a week arguing with Health Canada that we should be allowed to do it for this child and they finally agreed and um, at, Actually, at about 12 days of this, we looked under anesthetic because he's the first in the world to have this. And already all the little 30 tumors had almost disappeared and then they continued to disappear. He needed more treatments afterwards. And, uh, uh, but ultimately now, at, uh, that's what he looks like now. No extra, oh, I've lost another slide. Anyway, the, um, he, he uh, is now four years old with 2040 vision out four years from, not four years old, he's older than that, at four years from the chemo plaque. So this was very encouraging and that's when we started the STEP-RB clinical trial. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so next is Jillian. Jillian, if you can please uh, share your slides. Okay. Is everybody seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so first of all, I guess, thank you again to Crab um, for inviting me to participate as a panelist. Um, it was somewhat encouraging, as Sam said, I, I just completed a, a cup of tea presentation. So um, it was nice to, to sort of be invited back and know that that wasn't a complete fail. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really have enjoyed being, uh, I'm somewhat new member, but have enjoyed being part of this group and, and I really am learning a lot along the way. So happy to be here. Um, a little bit about my family's story, and I will try to focus on the STEP RB trial that um, my son Samson was a part of, but um, our journey began with retinoblastoma treatment when he was diagnosed around six months old. Uh, we started right away with four rounds of systemic chemo. Uh, we've done many laser and cryo treatments throughout his treatment journey. Uh, we have done some ar intra-arterial chemo as well. Um, a few more rounds of systemic chemo, uh, and that led us to the step RB trial for his right eye, which um, since his diagnosis has always been sort of the, the worst case out of the, out of the two, it was bilateral RB. Um, I also will mention that uh, when we started the genetic testing to see if he had the genetic predisposition to cancer, uh, we discovered he was missing a piece of the 13th chromosome. So he has what's called 13Q deletion syndrome, um, which is characterized of course by RB because he's missing the RB1 gene, um, but also in Sam's case, significant developmental delays, uh, both physical and cognitive. Uh, and he's recently been diagnosed with global developmental delay. And although this isn't part of the RB treatment, it is a big part of Sam's life. And um, he's participating in many early intervention therapies um, on the developmental side of things as well. Uh, 
Um, so just a little bit about his current status. Um, not only is he really cute, um, <laughs> but uh, he had his um, his chemo plaques removed um, in mid March of this year, um, and he had. Uh, I guess I should say before I start this that I do feel that um, the step RB trial was sort of the turning point in his treatment. And I know I listed sort of all those other things that we, we had been through, but um, since the chemo plaques were removed, he had one cryo treatment at the official end of the trial. So three weeks after removal of the chemo plaques. Um, and since then he has had no further treatment, uh, no active tumors, no enucleation, and he does have some vision. Um, so a lot of good news for Samson. Um, we're now doing follow-up visits every eight to 12 weeks, um, which feels like a lifetime compared to the every two or three weeks that we were doing for uh, a number of years. Um, and as I mentioned, he does have some vision. We don't know how much at this point. Um, we believe he sees better with his left eye than his right eye, uh, but he was able to keep both eyes. Um, he's walking now and he's navigating his environment quite well. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about why we chose to participate in the STEP RB trial. Um, two main reasons, one is the benefits for others and the other being the potential benefits for Samson. Um, and we did, my husband and I felt strongly about uh, being able to help future families and patients experiencing RB. We, um, throughout our own journey, had many, many kind, caring, supportive friends and relatives who helped us along the way. And uh, paying it forward has always been very important to us. So um, although the main purpose of the study is to learn and to advance the treatment of retinoblastoma, we knew that there, there could be a benefit for Samson. Um, and as I mentioned, we had tried systemic chemo, intra-arterial chemo, cryo, laser, um, and, and risk of enucleation of the right eye um, was, was there. So um, we did feel very informed about the trial. Um, we, we knew about the timelines, the risks. We heard about some experiences from other families. Uh, there was opportunity for Zoom meetings with the team and to discuss the trial. Um, so we did feel like we knew what we, get, we were getting ourselves into. And this, this image that I put in the presentation shows sort of an example of, of the information we were provided. So a detailed timeline and what to expect at each follow-up visit. Um, and ultimately we decided that the potential benefits, um, both for Samson and future <sighs> families outweighed the risks. Um, so a bit more about our experience throughout the trial. Um, again, as I mentioned, Sam had had many first line therapies, um, but still had active tumors. And so that's why we were asked to participate in the study. Um, and I do remember at the time feeling a bit like it was our last hope for his right eye. Um, we had done all of these other treatments and I wouldn't say unsuccessfully because we had come a long way and his left eye was was looking good. Um, I remember that we had actually wanted to start this, the, the study um, months before we were actually able to, but he didn't meet all the criteria due to some, some neutrophil counts. Um, so I can remember being disappointed at one point that we couldn't participate and then it turned out later on we were able to. Um, as Dr. Galley mentioned, the, the full length of the trial is considered, I guess, 10 weeks, but the chemo plaques are removed after six weeks, which is um, the most invasive part. Um, there was a combination of virtual and in-person follow-up assessments. And um, the way I understand it, because many of these follow-up appointments are really in line with the standard of care for retinoblastoma, there wasn't a lot of extra, extra hospital visits involved. A lot of it was, um, EUAs that we would have been going to anyways with other types of treatment. Um, and it was nice to have the virtual option as well. 
Um, I, I feel like I do need to be a bit transparent um, and say that there were certainly some unpleasant side effects for Samson. Um, and his eye was red and swollen and we think sore, although we can't tell us for sure. Um, but in the whole picture of his treatment journey, um, six weeks is not a long time. And we felt, you know, with the clear end date, we, we always had the end in sight and that, that definitely helped to get us through. Um, I, I can't say enough about the team. So Dr. Galley, Dr. Malapatna, Dr. Kletke, Dr. Shake. Um, we did feel like they were with us every step of the way and they helped us to understand everything before we even began the trial. They were always available throughout the trial for any concerns that we had. Um, I hope that Dr. Malapatna doesn't regret giving me his cell phone number. Um, <laughs> we, I definitely knew that he was there or the team was there anytime I had any concerns and we found that sending photos back and forth was a great way to communicate. Um, Dr. Galley checked in regularly as well. So although it's a bit scary to see the side effects um, in the eye um, as the trial was happening, uh, there was always someone to talk to about those concerns. So that was always reassuring. Um, and a little bit about the outcome. So as I mentioned for Samson, there was positive results. Um, and again, I know the purpose of the study is to learn more about the highest tolerated dose and the chemoplax and advancing the treatment of RB. But of course, as a parent, it's hard not to think about your own child. And uh, Samson did benefit from participating in the clinical trial. So I know my husband and I feel really good about um, being able to be part of this important research. And uh, I'm looking forward to one day telling Samson about how he contributed to helping other RB families. Um, and then on the other side of things, I, I hope that the research team learned something new. Um, I, I don't pretend to be a doctor or researcher, but I remember, um, I think it was about six or seven weeks after the removal of the chemo plaque. So the trial was officially over. Um, but I think we, we were seeing benefits of the trial longer than expected. And I don't know, maybe Dr. Galley can comment more on that, but um, I think this was a new experience for Samson. And when the trial ended and he did need follow-up cryo treatment, I remember feeling, you know, maybe at the time that that wasn't great news. Um, but then a few weeks later, things started to look much better and he hasn't had any treatment since. So um, I know that I will continue to follow the results of the trial. And I think the, the total length is three years. So I'm excited to see what's next um, in the step RB trial and in uh, RB treatments as a whole. Um, and this is really exciting for me as a parent, so I can only imagine how exciting and rewarding it is for, for you as researchers and clinicians. Um, and I guess finally, uh, just another quick thank you. I, I never wanna miss an opportunity to say thank you for the, to the team. Um, I know I mentioned some names already, um, but thank you to the Sick Kids RB team. And I know there's a lot, um, a lot of people, not maybe directly involved, but behind the scenes, and um, just to sort of repeat what Dr. Sheikh had said is I'm, I'm always really impressed by this crab community and how organized this group is um, for such a rare form of cancer. Um, so again, thanks for having me back and uh, I'm really happy to be involved. Um, so thank you all uh, panelists. We do, we are running a little bit short on time. Uh, so we do have time for only one question. So um, please go ahead. Um, is natural food source uh, for nutrition to the eye as a whole instead of chemo plaque, uh, chemo plaque? Is there a possibility of that happening? Could, could can you repeat the question? question? Take, take your mask down to speak, just so we can hear better. Yeah, I'm talking about natural food source for nutrition to the eye as a whole, instead of chemo plaque. Is that 
part is that being considered as a cure? Just no, I don't. to help out the, the eye? In theory, the, the, the chemo plaque is just a silicone cup, could contain anything, but I know of no scientific evidence for a natural source to, to use at this moment. If something came out, the chemo plaque shell could be used to deliver anything that would go through the sclera of the eye. Um, Could I just ask sure. Trevor? Trevor, uh, um, are uh, for the other predisposition groups that you've done this beautiful genetic work on? Do they have similar groups to crab behind them? Uh, some of them do, and some of them don't. So um, the ones that do certainly have a great network to spread the word and to share the research back. Uh, so I, I, it's really exciting, actually, that CRAB is so well established and it's a network like this to really accelerate the participation and encourage the follow up testing. That, especially on these longitudinal studies, is very impressive that you're able to do four or five year studies as a community, which is adherence to research over years is, is a big commitment. So kudos for that. Well, as you can see by the priorities of CRAB, that they have a, a group of people very concerned about. Um, survivorship, particularly with this um, rate heavily irradiated population. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much to our last pan, um, our previous panel. We're learning a lot and are being motivated to do what we can to move research forward. Um, so for our next panel, we have Ask the Experts. So I'd like to call um, Marie Ann Brundler. Um, Hallie Colton will be joining us virtually. If you could turn on your camera, please. Thank you. Beverly Griffiths, um, Terry Kelly, if you could join us back on stage, please. Matthew Mill and Alyssa Ulster, please. <laughs> We have a lot of experts and it was very difficult to select a small group. So as, the, as everyone's getting settled, I will try to save us a little bit of time and introduce our panel. Okay, so I'm gonna be going just in alphabetical order of last name. So there's no particular um, order, but I wanted to let you know who everyone is so that you can direct your questions to them. <clears throat> we have Marie Ann Brundler. She's a pediatric pathologist. Um, I'll note about um, Marie is uh, she examines eyes after a nucleation and reviews the findings with the RB team. The results of the pathological examination guide to the treatment after a nucleation. And through lectures and case reviews, she contributes to um, education and research projects on retinoblastoma. Hallie Colton is a pediatric oncologist and clinical investigator at CHU St. Justine. She completed pediatric neuro-oncology and retinoblastoma fellowships at SickKids from 2020 to 2022. Sorry, as I'm reading them, you guys can think of questions. And then when I'm finished, hopefully we'll have a lot of questions we can dive right into. Um, so Howdy joined the provincial retinoblastoma team at CHU St. Justine, which is located in Montreal, Quebec in September, 2022. She's an epidemiologist and health service researcher and studies the long-term health outcomes of cancer survivors and their family members, particularly brain tumor and retinoblastoma survivors. Beverly Griffiths is the eye clinic nurse here at SickKids. She does patient family support. Um, she also um, helps with sedation examination at the eye clinic at satellite units on 4C and 8C at the hospital. She assists with difficult examination and eye, drop, eye drops. She does teaching um, at pre-op, patching, newborn care, etc. She does triaging and referrals and ROP screening, just to name um, some of the tasks. We have Terry Kelly back with us with lived experience of retinoblastoma. He was our keynote speaker this morning. 
Um, as we already uh, shared, an athlete, singer, songwriter, professional speaker. So any other questions from Terry's uh, speech you could ask uh, at this time. Uh, we also have Matthew Milne here, ocularist and anaplastologist. Uh, a lot of people know Matthew who makes uh, uh, prosthetics here, specializes in pediatric ocular prosthetics with focus on retinoblastoma patients. He also sees people with trauma, congenial anomalies and disease. Uh, the clinic is located in downtown Toronto, just close to SickKids. We also have Alyssa Ulster, who many may know from uh, the retinoblastoma team. She's a social worker at the hospital. Um, uh, we could say she, she's considered a mental health clinician. She has been the social worker at the Department of Ophthalmology, including the RB program since early 1998. She provides crisis adjustment, grief and resource counseling, clinical consultation, and is involved in education and research initiatives. So we have a lot of experts here um, covering a wide array of topics and we would be happy to answer your questions for any of them. Since there's no hands rushing up right away while everyone's thinking. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Genevieve, go ahead. <laughs> I had a question before, but I didn't get the chance to ask it. So maybe one of the experts can answer for me. Uh, we were discussing genetics and uh, some of the topics that we were discussing were specifically related to bilateral survivors. And as a unilateral survivor, I am curious regarding some of the areas um, that I should also be mindful of. And I know that the risks are reduced, but how do I be the proper advocate for what I'm looking for in terms of screening and um, things that could be coming up um, with other survivors who are unilateral, but also experience um, secondary cancers or other issues afterwards? So I know that it's a diverse question, but pretty much the genetic side of it, um, we were discussing some of the secondary cancers, but as a unilateral survivor, I'm wanting to get a little more information about what I should be mindful of. Hallie, would um, that question be something you'd like to answer? Sure, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, I think a lot of the points have been mentioned by the other panelists. Um, I think the first, the first important piece is to be aware of, of potential late effects associated with, um, with being a retinoblastoma or survivor of retinoblastoma, I should say. Um, I think the importance of having um, uh, a regular physician, a family physician, um, who you can have an open, you know, open conversation with, because as it was, as it was mentioned, not, um, I think not every, you know, family medicine specialist is, is perhaps aware of some of the, of some of the, the late effects or some of the risks for survivors of retinoblastoma. Um, and I think, um, uh, I, I, you know, I think the other piece is, um, you know, being a part of, of this kind of this kind of forum and platform where, um, you know, where we're able to, you know, to share knowledge and, and updates, um, as well as research efforts looking forward. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Yeah, is that okay? Yes. I also just wanted to mention Rose, who's also part of the panel. I think her slide may have been skipped inadvertently, but Rose is an so. incredible genetic counselor who's part of the Sick Kids um, Cancer Program. And, and thank you so much for joining the panel, Rose. And my question is actually a genetics question. Um, I guess I just thought it might be useful if you wouldn't mind, Rose or others, what if you had to share one thing to a newly diagnosed family who is newly affected by retinoblastoma from a kind of genetic standpoint, is there one key message you want to make sure that is taken away from your first session with them? Thank you. Um, yeah, so just a, as a little bit of background, um, I think most people in this audience probably have spoken to a genetic counselor, but just to make sure we're sort of all on the same page, I think you know, our role in the RV community is to help share information about the role of genetics in RV, and it can be really complex information. And so I think 
you know, we try to put a lot of, we try to share a lot of information in those sessions to help people feel informed and, and be able to, um, um, like we've been talking about, be able to advocate for themselves. Um, but I think actually the, the biggest takeaway from, from my sessions are actually not so much a piece of information, but the fact that the, we are always available to answer questions because we recognize that at the, at the beginning of a, a diagnostic journey, um, especially for RB, um, there's a lot of overwhelming information. And so we were, you know, myself and my colleagues always encourage people to come back to us with genetics questions or with questions in general that we might be able to actually um, reroute to a, a more appropriate person if needed, um, because we recognize that it is um, very overwhelming to receive so much information at once. Rose, I'm really sorry I didn't. That's okay. I missed that slide. <laughs> My apologies. That's all right. No worries. Another question? Yeah, um, thanks everyone. I guess my question follows on what Rose um, spoke about, but it's directed at Terry. And so Terry, given that in the initial panel, we talked about um, perhaps a new blood test that could more effectively screen for second cancers. What are your thoughts on designing such a health service so that we empower retinoblastoma thrivers and not cause undue stress? And I guess it's a question for you and other people in the audience. What's the best way to screen for second cancers given that it is kind of a scary thing? So, so was that funny? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so you're wanting to know um, how to inspire others to embark upon a, th a thriving, to thrive as opposed to just survive. Is that, is that what you mean? Sorry. I don't know if I can Yeah, I, I guess um, second cancers are scary and they're scary because they're not going to be as good as they could be. And so Okay, so this is my opinion, um, and, and, and so not always with the. So, I, th I think more knowledge is absolutely a good thing, um, and it depends, I guess, how it's presented, and always the individual um, has to be considered. So, how can this be presented to? A person. So for me, I want to know everything. I want to know, you know, I, I, you know, candor to me is a beautiful thing. So tell me everything. Uh, I'll ask. The, the, then it, it inspires me to ask questions, and then I say, okay, so what can I, what can I do? Um, we know anxiety. Uh, if I'm an anxious person, if I'm if, I, if I'm under stress, um, if I have if I'm uh, if I have a another medical situation, sometimes it affects me differently, individuals differently. So it's not, I, I don't think I have a real clear answer to it. I, th I think maybe the simplest thing is consider the individual, um, find out what, where their comfort zone is, and how do you want to hear this? Ask them and um, give them lots of room to ask questions. And I think that, um, you know, sometimes, even over the last three years, there was a lot of, a lot of people were afraid uh, and not necessarily having all the answers or the way it was presented was very uh, scary when maybe it didn't have to be that scary. So, and that, so that's a general, general public thing, but it comes down to the individual as well. Is that too vague and woolly? Go ahead, Genevieve. I was going to just direct a question to Matt. Is there anything new going on in the forms or making of prosthetics that we could be aware of? Uh, so in terms of like a technology standpoint, um, really the, the materials are pretty, um, 
pretty standardized. I guess there are there's there's um, there's some people using kind of a dilating pupil in an actual prosthesis, so that's something that's fairly new. Uh, and so that'll actually it kind of mimics the same idea as kind of the, uh, the 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 graduated sunglasses. They can go back and forth. They can use that technology instead of a prosthesis. They're starting to be able to do that. Yep. So, so that's that's kind of that's the one interesting point that's kind of come forward for that, uh, and that can help a lot of people, especially if you have a lighter colored eye. That really helps in you know, different situations. I had two sets made one time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Well, the discussion that we have often about we know some survivors who wear sparkly eyes or wear a star as an eye, and for myself it feels way too overt. Yeah. Um, but I commend those that are comfortable enough to. Yeah, yeah, and so I mean, and like social media has been a big part of that right. as well. So like TikTok, there's a couple people on TikTok that are doing um, kind of fun eyes, as they call them, and so that's that's something that a lot of people are kind of exploring. Uh, I think it's nice having both. Like I think having a normal prosthesis or a, a complementary prosthesis is is an everyday type of thing, and then having something fun as well kind of allows you to kind of explore yourself and have a little more fun with it. Um, if you're comfortable with it, yeah, exactly, exactly. Can you turn on your mic, please? Oh, sorry, you have a mic. Okay. Yep, yep. Oh, there you go. All right. Um, I have two questions. Or... Sorry. <laughs> um, so the first uh, question, comment. Okay. Um, or if you could say it, I'll repeat it. All right. Uh, uh, the first question or comment is from Catherine King. Um, she was wondering if the panelists could please um, summarize the differences between um, heritable and non-heritable risks. So can the panelists summarize differences between heritable and non-heritable risks? Good. <laughs> So I think um, I maybe we'll um, rephrase the question in a different way and or, or rather, so I guess when somebody has a heritable retinoblastoma um, or what in genetics, we actually prefer to say hereditary retinoblastoma because it's, it's the risk for retinoblastoma, not the, um, not the fact that the retinoblastoma is itself inherited. Um, so people who have a genetic change that makes them predisposed to retinoblastoma are at risk for retinoblastoma, but also these secondary cancers that we've been talking about. Um, cases that present as bilateral, we know have an underlying genetic reason for their retinoblastoma. Unilateral cases, um, about 15% of unilateral cases will be due to a genetic uh, variant that has caused their retinoblastoma. And those individuals have what we call a sporadic retinoblastoma, meaning that, um, uh, sorry, and those individuals have uh, hereditary retinoblastoma if they have the mutation, but there are um, individuals who have unilateral retinoblastoma that do not have a, a genetic mutation and therefore are not at risk for those secondary types of cancers. And they're not at risk for the retinoblastoma in the second eye. Um, I'm not sure if that summarizes what Dr. Patton was looking for, but I'm happy to offer clarification also. Thank you. And there's just one more question as well. And this is for uh, Marianne Brundler. Um, can you please describe for patients what pathology entails and why it can take one to two weeks to get results? Oh, sorry, I didn't understand the second part of the uh, question. What does pathology entail and what happens in that one to two weeks while patients are waiting for results? <laughs> okay, I'll try to do this in three sentences. <laughs> so there was a, I, I think you couldn't appreciate the picture because it was so quick. So 
the, the highest sense of pathology, and then it has to go through a process uh, that allows us to cut those microscopic sections. And that process itself takes several days because we have to put it in a chemical that fixes or fixates the eye that makes it really, that we can process it. And then those sections are cut, um, they're mounted on a glass slide and we have to stain them because if we don't stain them, we cannot see anything under the microscope. And then the pathologist, in this case, it's myself, uh, looks at the um, eye under the microscope. And usually this is not a single section, it's quite a tray of sections. So I see between 30 and 40 sections, slides, and I have to look at all those slides. And then I have a protocol available, an international protocol that I use to walk me through how I have to look at the slide and what are the appearances. Uh, so how does the, what does the tumor look like? How big is the tumor? Where is located in the eye? And does it involve structures outside? So in the eye that would then uh, purport or like would mean that the patient is at a higher risk of potentially spreading or recurring somewhere else. And so, so the processing takes about three to five days um, at least, because it depends when it arrives during the week. And then because I don't live in Toronto, they have to be shipped currently to Calgary, which takes two days. And then I also need time to look at it. And then usually before I issue a report, I speak to the team because we don't actually walk. Pathologists are seeing those who, who kind of live and work in a dark corner usually in the basement of a hospital who don't talk to anybody. Um, and then they kind of issue a piece of paper and then they go hide again. Um, that's not how we are supposed to work anymore. So then also usually connect with the retinoblastoma team who meet once a week. And if I know it's a bit more urgent, I will kind of, Ashwin also made a mistake to give me his cell phone number. <laughs> So I will reach out to him and say, hey, can we talk or I'll send you an email. So, but for me, it's important to connect with the team and also to hear these stories because what I do would have no meaning if I actually did it in a dark corner because it's important for me to understand what, is the, what are the needs of the clinical team, but also of the patients. Thank you for that. Yes. Uh -oh. Hello. Yeah. Okay, good. Hi, um, I have two questions. So you can tell me if you have time for either of them. One is for the geneticists um, and maybe everyone in general. Um, and this might be too broad, but what do you think is the role of epigenetics in RB or if there is any for um, treatment or just in general, if, if epigenetics plays a role in that? And then um, for uh, Alyssa, what do you think, if you could narrow it down, what are families, what's the one thing that families are missing or requesting the most um, when they're coming to see you? Thanks. Um, can people hear me? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, what I would say families are definitely asking for, um, and, and it's not all families, but I would say uh, some families certainly are asking for support. So whether that be um, from uh, the RB uh, community um, being, um, being, matched, being matched potentially with another uh, family or families whose ch child has also gone through a similar experience. Um, but I would say, uh, and also just uh, a knowledge. Um, again, I know, someone had posed a question in terms of, um, you know, how, how do we convey information or what is too much? And I think it really varies, but also just looking at what, what the needs of um, an individual family are. Some families want as much information um, about everything as soon as possible and other families are just not, uh, not feeling there yet, but we want to certainly make sure that they do have the information when, uh, when they need it. I guess to speak to the epigenetics piece, I, I think Dr. Galley probably knows this better than I do. I think clinically, um, we don't do testing for any epigenetic 
changes currently, but we know that in, in our whole genome, so in all the DNA in our bodies, there are lots of epigenetic changes. So I think it's certainly an interesting place to, to research in RB. Oh. Yep, there we go. So, so I think that it's not the broad epigenetics, perhaps, that the question's about, but some of the um, ways the RB gene is inactivated is through epigenetics, where the gene is instead of the protein being able to produce a message to make the, the gene being able to produce a message that has a stake in it, which causes it makes a bad protein, that there can be no protein because the whole gene is shut down by um, genes, uh, mutations that are upstream of the actual gene. But also um, it, um, if the error that might be a deletion results in the X chromosome being adjacent to the chromosome 13, which has a perfectly normal retinoblastoma gene. And the X chromosome normally in everybody has an ability to shut down genes that are next to it. And then the two pieces of chromosome 13 and X do the wrong thing. And that's epigenetics that inactivates it. But when we come back to, um, to the whole genome, looking for changes in it, you saw that methylation was a big signal of other cancers. So that's, um, Methylation is acting through epigenetics too, I think. Am it I is. right? Yep. It is. Yeah. Yes. I have two more questions. Uh, so the first one is for Alyssa Ulster. Are there any services available to support siblings of newly diagnosed children? The question was, are there services for siblings of diagnosed, <laughs> diagnosed children? Yeah, so... Um, so certainly uh, this has been a bit of a challenge, I think for myself and a lot of my colleagues in social work, just knowing that there's a greater need. Um, certainly, um, I guess, depending on the age of the child, I could certainly, um, a family could certainly speak to me and we could, uh, we could certainly explore what options might exist or whether even I would have some brief uh, contact with the SIP. Um, and otherwise um, we would look at, I would look at um, what other options in the community uh, may exist as well to help support SIBs because um, I do realize that um, unfortunately resources are, um, you know, there, there are some limitations to the resources that we do have. So, um, but certainly uh, it, it's, it's a really valid uh, concern of many families. How do they support their children and how do they, um, how do they support the siblings who are also experiencing their own kind of journey with, uh, among the family? Thank you. And the second question is for uh, Beverly Griffiths. Um, what are some aspects of your job as a nurse that are unique to retinoblastoma? What, what are, are some... some aspects to your job as a nurse that are unique to retinoblastoma? <laughs> okay, so generally um, when a patient is newly diagnosed or when they come in the first time, I'm usually there with the team and to help support the family and do a lot of consoling. And after the physician has uh, made a diagnosis and they have done their little part, I am there to help reinforce it and clarify any questions they have and help to navigate them to the next step. You know, what next is coming, what they need to do, um, um, help them if they need to have blood work done, you know, help them through that. Um, if they need the child need to be admitted, um, you know, the process involves in that, um, the feeding guidelines that needs to happen, and if there are any other health issues to help them, you know, help them with that. And um, just be, and be there for them. Also, recently we are now, because we also do sedation in our clinic, we're also um, now being able to um, sedate the children in clinic instead of them going to the operating room for their basic EUA. So we are able to do that. But as you can see from the photo, there are three nurses in our clinic. And so we, um, we don't have a nurse designated as such assigned to the RB program, but I got interested because there were so many families who didn't have that support. And so we're gonna have a designated nurse who will actually be assigned to totally do RB. But as um, the nurse in the clinic, I also support the coordinator. 
So if she has questions and needs clarification, I'm there to support her for that. And also help to guide our physicians so that they can you know, get certain things done and um, just reinforce, <laughs> somebody's hiding their face, reinforce, reinforce a lot of stuff and be there for the team and the families. And I still know a lot of people here and a lot of kids have outgrown me you know, through the years and I'm here for everyone. I'm really the glue that holds them all together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to add to that a little bit, if possible. I just wanted to know, say that um, you know, it's not only uh, that way that the nurses, sorry, it, it's not only uh, that way that the nurses support retinoblastoma care at uh, sick kids. I think uh, there's a lot more than that. It's it's. Uh, probably very understated how much the nurses support the doctors in retinoblastoma care. And I think uh, that, you know, whether it comes to explaining, uh, backing us up on explanations of enucleations, artificial eyes, or whether it comes to explaining sedation or what the patients have to go through and, you know, uh, every support, even during disclosure to be there in the room when the diagnosis is being made and being explained to each uh, parent. I think uh, the amount that we get support from our team over here is very understated and that may be a good time to say that. And uh, another last mention to say that Bev has my uh, cell phone number too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I, I just add that you, you, you saw many books that, um, on the, the my, my fake eye which have all been written. The very first one was written by Bev years ago. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, we are at the end of this panel and I think we've learned a lot, but we also have now put a face to some of the names we might've seen. And I do encourage everyone um, who's seen the panelists so far and then also for the following panel, when you're on break or during lunch to go say hello and we're all, um, learning together and our experts in this field of retinoblastoma. Thank you. Thank you guys. And I would like to invite the next panel. So our next panel is priority number four, follow up and follow through. And Caitlin, I will open it up to you. I'm gonna jump right in because I know we're running a little bit late. Hi, Brittany. It's you. Thank you. So I'll just jump in and do a really quick introduction and then get us started. This is um, a panel dedicated to priority four, which was trying to um, unpack a bit more about the optimal follow-up, both from an oncology and an ophthalmology standpoint for retinoblastoma, um, for heritable retinoblastoma patients and how do we ensure that that follow-up is provided to everyone? And um, there is four panelists uh, joining this session. Um, the first speaker will be Bruce Crooks, who's a pediatric hematologist um, at the IWK Health Center and an associate professor at Dalhousie University. And Bruce has been a member of CRAB since it was established back in 2016. And in addition to his very busy clinical service, Bruce is also a collaborator on many national and international pediatric cancer projects. And I know that one of his many interests are the late effects um, in pediatric cancer survivors. We also have Ashwin Malapatna, who is a pediatric ophthalmologist and head of Sick Kids Retinoblastoma Program. Ashwin um, has a busy research lab and a big part of it is bridging disciplines, including physics, computer science, and engineering to try and innovate novel approaches to enhance cancer detection. And then both of our panelists with live experience have been part of um, CRAB for some time and taken part in our previous symposia. We have Marg McFarlane, who's a retired teacher and a two-time cancer survivor. Um, her mother, daughter, and nephew all had retinoblastoma. And although Marg did not have any retinoblastoma tumors, she and two of her siblings have a retinoblastoma, an RB1 mutation rather, um, and were cautioned that they also have a high risk of getting second cancers or other cancers. Uh, she's very hopeful that there can be improvements made in adult follow-up regarding second cancers. And then we also have Ella Bowles, who's a bilateral retinoblast who had bilateral retinoblastoma. Um, she's a biologist with the Canadian Wildlife Service. 
And she comes to this panel as an advocate for access to education and workplace equity for those who are visually impaired and as an advocate for RB genetic testing. And she's worked on retinoblastoma research um, to quite a big extent in the past. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Bruce. <laughs> Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure and uh, an honor to be invited to come and speak uh, to the rest of my retinoblastoma family here. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. I'm sorry I was late this morning. Um, uh, Firkin gave me two minutes to present a case at Tumor Board yesterday, so obviously I only have like five minutes more to be able to do this panel. Um, and I could speak for hours and hours, days and days, weeks and weeks and years on survivorship and late effects. Uh, and it's the, uh, it's the forgotten service, really, of pediatric oncology care. And uh, obviously, I know that uh, many of the people here are survivors. Um, really, what I wanted to talk a little bit about is introducing the concepts of long-term follow-up and survivorship and just give a very, very brief and high overview, but really turn it over to our lived survivors. Uh, who are Marg and Ella as well. Uh, and then um, Ashwin, I've asked, uh, will, will sort of speak a little bit of what the, the retinoblastoma focused follow up as well, because I do a lot of follow up for a lot of different people. Um, if you go to the NIH, they have a glossary of cancer terms, and this is what they come up with with survivorship. I'm not going to read it out, but basically it's health and well being of anybody from the beginning of their cancer journey right the way through the rest of their life. And it involves all dimensions of their health and their well-being and their care. Um, it also issues, uh, involves issues of long-term follow-up, late effects, which are the effects of treatment, which I'll talk a little bit about later. But also, everybody who shares that journey is also deemed to be part of survivorship. And so everybody, every single person in here that looks after people with cancer children with uh, retinoblastoma, whatever, second cancers, is also a survivor as well. <clears throat> so you are definitely survivors. And in the world of pediatric oncology, which is where a lot of this concept has come from, this is really who they are. This is fairly old data. It's about 10, 12 years old. But you can see here, particularly, that retinoblastoma here has a 99% survival rate. Uh, and these are from North American data. So this is definitely not worldwide and unfortunately is skewed. Um, there are a lot of others that approach this, but uh, retinoblastoma is the most survivable of those cancers. So all of those people are going to be survivors. And we do know that survivors, because of the treatments and because of their underlying conditions, have a huge burden of disease over and above people who haven't suffered the same conditions. So if you look at this little graphic here, which is uh, again some data from the North American uh, SEA project, which is the long-term late effects and uh, covered about 20,000 uh, survivors of childhood cancer. You can see that here in this column, this is the likelihood of a patient having a problem. So for instance, a second malignancy, they're 2.3 to eight times more likely than compared with one of their siblings. So these are the siblings that don't have the cancer. So their risk rate was 0.33, a second malignancy, 2.38. That's huge. And heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, relationships, mental health, all these different dimensions. Survivors of cancer have bigger risks of further diseases. And if we look at this and we think about it, uh, and certainly a trajectory of care, <clears throat> excuse me, Everybody runs over themselves. Somebody presents with a symptom. You rush over yourself. Everything is going helter-skelter to get a diagnosis. And so there is a lot of activity when it comes to diagnosis. And then obviously, as you know, with retinoblastoma in particular, active treatment, you're in, you're out, you're having an EUA. Two or three weeks later, you're coming in, you're having chemotherapy, another EUA. And this is a roller coaster ride. Eventually, this calms down when the cancer is under control or is gone, and you come into follow-up surveillance, which again is fairly intense because you're still coming, you're having your EUAs, you're having your scans, you're having your checkup visits, but gradually this fades away. And almost you forget that eventually you come into long-term follow-up, which is lifelong. And maybe you're only being seen every year, every couple of years, whatever else it is. And this is kind of where people get forgotten 
and they fall through the gaps and they disappear, they move, they lose contact with clinics. And as people have already seen, long-term follow-up, it's horrendously difficult to get into any sort of care for that if you're not already there. And this is where the late effects come in because late effects are problems that occur months or years after your original treatment. And they can affect all sorts of different parts. And I've got a slide that will come up in a moment. And the risks and the impact of those late effects progresses with time. As you've seen that second malignancy rate, you saw the graph of second malignancies in radiotherapy versus no radiotherapy in retinoblastoma. Those two curves, they went up and they separated. Same is true for late effects. And we all feel that regular follow-up care is very important for survivors of childhood cancer. And it, the paradigm for childhood cancer care is lifelong follow-up. What happens in reality is far, far different from that. And again, healthy living and good habits, including nutrition, whatever else it is, are also really, really important for education and advocacy for childhood survivor cancer uh, patients. I usually um, animate this, and so all these things, they pop up, but I decided not to do that because inevitably it would go wrong in seven minutes. So this is a slide with some of those dimensions of late effects. And the ones that I've put in blue, if uh, for those of you that aren't colorblind or uh, can see certainly, um, are definitely medical orientated late effects. But you can also have psychosocial related effects like stress and fatigue, PTSD, there's body image, there's physical stuff like activity, mobility, pain, there's sight, there's hearing, there's neurological problems, there's second cancers, there's cosmetic and, uh, and body image, etc. There are huge different dimensions and everybody is different. No two people have the same, and no two groups of people have the same late effects as this. So somebody who's had a bone tumor will be looking at a different constellation from a retinoblastoma survivor or a leukemia survivor. And that's why you have to tailor this to them. And so really our paradigm for long-term follow-up really should be that this should be lifelong. Once you have a cancer diagnosis, you should go from cradle to grave, much like family medicine. And it should be multidisciplinary. So the services that you need should be allied along with that clinic. And it's risk-based. So whatever your risks are, whatever your risk factors, your late effects, it should be tailored to that. And also brings in, as Mary and Maureen were saying, a lot of self-advocacy, self-education, and awareness of your own conditions and your own health. And again, education so that people just don't go, I have no idea what I had when I was younger. Somebody just told me I had cancer. And you don't realize the number of times I hear that story. The problem is that this is so not equal across Canada. In the Maritimes, I don't have access to any long-term follow-up for adult survivors. We have to discharge back to family medicine because there is no service. And in Nova Scotia, 13% of patients don't have a family medicine doctor. So they lose and they're lost to follow up. There are certain places like Hamilton where they have a chair in childhood cancer survivorship. So Dr. Stacey Majerison, she has a personal chair, the Ronnie Barr chair. Sick Kids has a program. Edmonton has a program. Ottawa has a program. BC has a program, but it doesn't have everybody in it. So that's a problem. What we do know is that there are some resources and so, for instance, this is a guideline that anybody can download, especially healthcare providers. And this is the most comprehensive evidence-based guideline for the late effects. There's a, a website that I've got there, Matthew. So that's all right. It's on here. You can just Google this, long-term follow-up guidelines from Children's Oncology Group. And you can download this, and it's updated every few years. And this, for instance, is a page. Please don't remember this. Please don't try to read it. But okay. these, this is, it's too tiny, and it's just for an example, please. And this is about carboplatin and cisplatin. Carboplatin, many retinoblastoma uh, survivors have had this. But it says what the late effects are, what the evaluations for looking for those long-term late effects, and what the potential complications can be. So it tells you what you should do if you've had this chemo chemotherapy, or you've had radiotherapy, or you've had surgery, or whatever else it is. And you can put this together. 
The other thing that we've just got hold of is that this was a project that came out from COG from, uh, from the United States, from Balliol College, and it's called Passport for Care. And this is a web-based program which includes all those guidelines that I've just told you about. And what you do is you input your information, your cancer care clinic inputs your information, and it spits out um, a, a program for you, for your healthcare and your aftercare, which is web-based, so it's portable. You can take it anywhere. And if you end up at a clinic in the Yukon and you say, yeah, I had retinoblastoma and intraarterial chemotherapy when I was younger, I guarantee that that emergency medicine uh, doctor, their head will explode when you say this and they go, I have no idea what to do with you. And you go, don't worry, here's my passport for care. And so you can do that. The problem is it's not available to everybody yet, but it's one of the ways that we can help. And I think I'm running out of time and I'm gonna stop there because I so want Ella and Marg to speak as well. But I'm very, very happy to ask questions, answer questions as well. Come and find me afterwards. This is one of my, this is one of my enthusiastic projects, but thank you very much. And here, <laughs> Those are, two, those are two web addresses, so you can actually get these, and they're very, very easy to get hold of. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> we'll ask Ashwin to come up next, if that's okay, and then we'll conclude with the um, lived experience uh, session. Thanks, Bruce, for setting the pace on that one. That was a fantastic talk, I think, well summarizing everything that uh, we need to be mindful of. Sorry, I keep forgetting to take my mask off for this. Uh, but I'm going to focus very quickly on what we would like to see only with the eye care after retinoblastoma treatment. Uh, I think part of it is uh, defining when an eye is considered cured from retinoblastoma. And as soon as it's considered cured, starts follow-up. So uh, the things that we take into consideration for one may lead into the other. Uh, we look at age and genetic status of each child. We look at uh, enucleation versus eye salvage. And uh, in each situation, the cure is considered at a different time. Uh, the duration from last treatment may be something that we look at. And it's also quite complicated because... We also look at sometimes the response to treatment and what's happened even after an enucleation or after I salvage that determines when people require their follow-up. So it's hard to determine one formula for everybody in these situations, but uh, really to look at uh, those determinants separately, maybe we can look at age as one of the most important ones because as we know that as we grow older, the problems either tend to uh, um, uh, be less uh, of a risk in terms of the tumor coming back, especially, but in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the eye tumor coming back, that is. But there are other considerations that come up with age. So age is one of those factors that determine follow-up. Uh, laterality and genetics, they sort of link to each other, in other words, and those with a genetic predisposition for second cancers have a different pathway for follow-up as, uh, as opposed to the others. Um, and in terms of even treatment received, you know, if there is enucleation and in, then you have the enucleation related follow ups that come up, such as high risk pathology, where how quickly do we follow up after we know that the child has been high risk? Um, uh, and whether there are eye socket concerns in any way that come that bring the children back to follow up. Um, uh, and even those that are related <coughs> to eye salvage itself. You know, the retinal pa pattern of regression and retinal scars and complications can sort of be grouped together in terms of causing retinal complications. Sometimes we're seeing uh, uh, late teenagers and adults coming up with changes in some of their old scars in the retina as well. Um, the, based on what treatment you've had, you could have a cataract, a strabismus, or, uh, you know, in, in early ages, you're trying to uh, best the vision uh, in, in terms of preventing a lazy eye. Um, and radiation related complications. So, you know, there are many things that we take into consideration and maybe uh, I just stop over here because I'm just listing them out in this slide and not really determining anything because there isn't anything to determine at this point and it's something that we'd like to get better at going forward. Um, so thank you very much and I'll pass the stage on to Ella. I think Mark is oh, sorry. actually going next, sorry. Mark. Yeah, that's my mistake here. <laughs> You're okay. Sorry, this thing fix it. 
ja. Okay, sorry, wrong order. Please go ahead. Here. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, as you heard in the introduction before, I didn't have an RB tumor, but I and my two brothers have the mutation. My mother, daughter, and nephew all had RB. And probably similar to you, we were all told that any lumps or bumps or pain or any medical condition that wasn't resolved in a reasonable amount of time should be investigated more thoroughly. And Mary uh, mentioned in numerous, a number of other people have mentioned that self-advocacy seems to be how this needs to be handled. There isn't any specific program or, or list of things that you do. So we all try to be very vigilant and, and keeping track of what's happening in our own lives and, and seeing doctors when needed. Um, my daughter, who's now 34, you're welcome, Jen. Um, after her time at SickKids, went for checkups with an ophthalmologist every year for a while and then eventually changed to two years. As she's out on her own and, and monitors her own health and, and goes to see people as needed. Um, the unfortunate part of our story is that Jen and my mother and myself all found that over the years we've spent a lot of time trying to convince medical staff to take our concerns regarding our increased risk seriously, that it's not something imagined or exaggerated. Uh, one example of, of that is just recently, Jen felt that she should get a long-term condition checked more thoroughly because it hadn't been resolved and she just wanted to make sure that she wasn't missing something. She wanted to uh, have a, a check, a scan or something like that, just to make sure there wasn't something hiding. She talked to her doctor about it. He didn't see any further a need for further investigation, but Jen is someone who, who takes that responsibility of keeping informed and staying on top of things seriously, and she'd read that epithelial tissues are at particular risk for those who have RB mutations, and her particular medical issue involves the esophagus and stomach, which are epithelial tissues. So she explained this to the doctor. They had some discussion, and that resulted in a scope being booked. Thankfully, nothing nefarious was found beyond the original issues. So it just confirmed for us it's important to know things, to keep up to date, to, to know about your own risk and, and the, the details of those risks so that that can help in inform discussions with doctors. Now, as far as my own experience, and that was a little bit different. In 2009, after three years, of going to numerous doctors, being told by a couple of them they thought my problem was likely IBS. Another two, including one at a major hospital in Toronto, a specialist said, it's definitely not cancer. One said to me, it can't be cancer because you've gained weight rather than lost weight. I was eventually, as I said, after three years of doing this, I was eventually diagnosed with leiomyosarcoma. And over that time, I'd kept track of my symptoms on a calendar, moving from dotted lines to, to circles, and then near the end, red circles indicating um, much more um, strong symptoms. And that became a very good visual record of the increasing frequency and duration of those symptoms. Now, the people that did eventually diagnose cancer listened to me, noted the progression in that visual record, talked about the added risk because of RB, and decided to do a scan that I hadn't had from the other doctors I'd, I'd gone to see. Up to that point, in those three years, I'd had one scope, no scans, no x-rays, no CTs, nothing. Um, so eventually, I ended up at Mount Sinai. And I was told there that leiomyosarcoma is usually a very aggressive cancer. So thinking back on the previous three years, I realized I was incredibly lucky that in this case, the tumor hadn't followed the usual path of that disease, that it had grown uncharacteristically slowly. Thank goodness. Otherwise, things might have ended very differently. Clearly, most of the people I went to see, although they were professional, polite, and, and welcoming enough, were either unaware of 
or didn't take seriously the impact of an RB mutation. Now, since that diagnosis and treatment at, at, at Sinai, I go yearly for CAT scans just to keep on top of things and make sure that if a recurrence, heaven forbid, happens, it'll get caught early. Uh, in that plan, I know normally it's, you hear, you know, after five years, you're, you're okay, or we monitor for so many years, and then you're released. But in discussion with my oncologist at Sinai, she said, well, given your RB background, I think we just keep doing them, which was good to hear. I don't like the idea of all those tests, but I, I want to know if something is found and, and get ahead of things uh, and not have to um, regret uh, afterwards. So anyway, the, uh, that diagnosis um, taught me a lot. Uh, it, it, it taught me that I, you really need to pay attention to your own body, your own feelings. And despite running up against roadblocks, you just keep going. Um, in 2021, I again <clears throat> had to meet with a doctor around some, some concerns. And um, that person, I shared the RB background. We had some discussion. Um, I shared a letter. It was a very basic letter that Dr. Galley had given all of us that stated that we had a mutation and any things needed to be looked into if they weren't resolving. She paid attention to that. Diagnostic testing showed precancerous cells in this case. She recommended surgery and said sooner rather than later, we don't want to take chances because of that added risk. And she was able to book a surgery date within a few weeks and that has all been resolved and things are good. My second Cancer diagnosis is actually current. Just a moment. It took about seven and a half months from the first appointment until the final surgery. It was nerve wracking, you know, waiting for the next appointment and for the next test and things like that. But what a difference it made when you felt things happening and people listening, it went a whole lot faster than that previous experience. When I did finally get to see the appropriate oncologist for this particular problem, it ended up being bladder cancer. Um, I was presented with numerous options for moving forward. We talked about them all and it was up to me um, they said to decide which way to go. Now I kept referring to my RB background. He seemed, the, the oncologist seemed somewhat familiar with RB, but he, the terminology he used and the questions he asked were, were unusual. They, they didn't sound like what I was used to. And he asked to see detailed proof. Now I didn't have any detail with me, but I went through uh, records that we had and I kept everything from when Jen was at Sick Kids and everything that we got from Dr. Galley and, and uh, notes we took from visits. And I found in there letters from 1996 from the genetic counselor at Sick Kids that gave detail about my specific mutation and the family's uh, details. Eventually, uh, once my oncologist acknowledged that the RB factor needed to be considered, it really made a big difference in determining a treatment plan. And it led to um, a more customized approach, something that made sense given all the factors involved. And, and I'm happy to say that things are looking good. And I'll conclude just by saying, um, like others, I'm so grateful for this event and for the work that CRAB is doing because it really is critical that we learn uh, what's going on in Ontario and across Canada and, and possibly further afield that's working and what isn't working. We need to find better ways for people to access the help that they need in a timely manner because as we know with cancer, that's the whole thing. Getting it done and seen in time can make the difference between a, a decent outcome and a tragic one. Maybe we need a, an, an if this exists and I've missed out, I apologize, but uh, maybe we need to follow up best practices document or, or um, program for medical staff and for patients. Something that helps empower patients to strongly advocate for themselves because <coughs> getting appropriate care shouldn't be this kind of a challenge. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Mark, for sharing that, um, your lived experience and for being so honest with us and sharing all your lessons that you've learned. It, um, it means a lot. And we're, I think I speak for everyone when I say we're so happy to hear the outcome of your latest diagnosis and that you're doing well. You. The last panelist uh, with this session is Ella Bowles. Thank you. Um, <laughs> wow, it's a little daunting to go last. I don't know. I thought it was Jen daunting to go first. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Caitlin. And um, thank you, a huge thank you to all of the organizers of this symposium and the physicians, clinicians, everybody associated with uh, retinoblastoma care. As a patient, I'm just deeply grateful. Um, so just as a, a bit of a recap and slight expansion of my background, because I think that um, impacts my experience of long-term follow-up. So I had bilateral retinoblastoma and um, my right eye was enucleated and then had um, cryotherapy and xenon arc, which is the predecessor to laser, if I'm correct, Brenda, <laughs> um, in my other eye. So I'm visually impaired and um, being visually impaired has been um, a really important part of my journey. Uh, so um, I, um, you know, come to this symposium having um, worked as an advocate for people with visual impairment and uh, for genetic testing for retinoblastoma. Um, and then also having worked in research in Brenda's lab for a few years and on the National Retinoblastoma Strategy with um, many of the folks that are here. Uh, so I come to this work having had an, a tremendous opportunity to um, be educated. And I also come to this, um, the table, having, uh, my mother was a very strong advocate and, um, and really, uh, you know, like many of the parents here, has absorbed the information and advocated very strong, strongly for me over the years. So um, I guess all of this is to say that I come to this at a, with a very privileged position. So I would say that my care has been um, fairly consistent over the course of my life, um, being seen, you know, once I was stable, once every year to two years. Um, um, it's been stable and good on the ophthalmology side of things. Um, uh, with um, some of the physicians that I've seen asking me um, important questions about kind of overall health and can he, kind of any other concerns, but um, this is where I'll put the first but. Um, that has differed um, between ophthalmologists who I've seen who have had sort of retinoblastoma specific training and those who have not. And those who have not, I've been very surprised at the lack of understanding and information that they have about retinoblastoma. Um, and this is important in my case, and I think in you know many people's cases, because I've lived and worked in many cities across the country. So once I sort of left my childhood center of care, um, I really needed to be aware of how to advocate for myself what I needed and what I wanted to ask people to look for. Um, and, you know, in some instances, I was quite surprised about what I sort of needed to push towards. Um, and um, I would also say that, um, and this is, I mean, I guess more sort of things for the young families here to think about. Um, I uh, wasn't, you know, as a very young person aware that I would have such a difficulty accessing my records, medical records. I, we didn't keep everything as a family. And um, it's meant that I have a very sporadic record, which I think has, is, is not a good thing. <laughs> Most of my records are in some kind of vault in uh, Vancouver. <laughs> um, uh, and so as a more educated person, I have insisted that um, documentation be sent to me um, by the secretaries. And sometimes that's actually been quite a lot of advocacy to get that information. And having that information has proven to be very useful as I've moved to new centers of care. Um, so like one of the messages that I'd sort of like to kind of put out there is having an electronic tracking system, which I know is well in the works, um, you know, is something that I think would be very highly useful. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, I found that it uh, has been a really great challenge um, when I've gone to see any GPs or the few times that I've been to emergency and presented, you know, 
the fact that I had bilateral retinoblastoma, have a germline mutation, you know, and so have subsequent risks. It's been a, a real challenge <clears throat> to advocate for myself. There's a lot of uh, lack of understanding um, amongst physicians of, of all, all types, <laughs> for lack of a better word to put it. Um, and so I, um, you, you know, and that's compounded, I think, by the shortage of GPs and um, the challenge in getting a GP. I myself have been without a family physician for a very long time. And um, the standard of care at walk-in clinics is just, just much less. And my ability to build a relationship so that I can connect my circle of care um, is, um, is uh, th that I think is a considerable hindrance and that's, you know, a problem with the Canadian system, not something that we can sort of solve as a group, but I think, um, having, uh, digitized records of care would help a lot with that so that I could, you know, present that passport, you know, present whomever I'm going to see, um, with that package of information. Um, Let's see, what else did I want to see? I've kind of gone off track my little um, notes here. Um, yeah, right. So I think, you know, the, um, I guess the message, uh, one of the messages that I would like to leave you with, with everybody with, is to really strongly advocate for getting copies of your records and keep everything. Because um, that, you know, will be really useful in the end. Um, later down the road, um, you know, I've had a couple of uh, healthcare concerns that are not necessarily second cancers, but things for which I've needed to get scans and such, and um, and uh, and understanding what my risks are, and then and the treatments that I've had, and being able to present that in a concrete way to physicians has been very helpful in my own self advocacy. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ella. That was very um, informative and I appreciate your useful practical tips that you share with all the, the patient families here today. We're um, kind of dreadfully behind schedule right now. So we're gonna try and keep the Q&A to this panel to about no more than 10 minutes. So we'll try and take a break at 310 if everyone is agreeable to that. And I know we have at least one question from our um, at home participants. Roxanne, did you wanna share that first? So there's a question from Haral who asked, is there any suggestions or a way that we can create a guideline for parents with small kids about what are the risks uh, that they should have knowledge on, especially for those that don't have a medical background? So I'm just gonna repeat the question as, as far as I heard it at least. Um, it was asking if there was a guideline um, in place for families documenting the risks that children might have based on the treatment they had. Is that what you said, Roxanne? Uh, based on treatment and uh, heritability status. And okay, so the risks in general based on their experience. Um, yeah, so Dr. sure, Prince? thanks. Um, certainly within the pediatric oncology world, um, then part of, part of planning for long-term follow-up uh, in our clinics and everything like that involves taking your risks and putting those together to create a personalized um, document. So, the, the, the survivorship guidelines that I illustrated and put up the slide of are a general thing. It's, it's a huge document. It's like umpteen megabytes long, uh, and it's a PDF. But you can actually pick out individual pieces and selections based on what you have, you have undergone. So if you've had surgery, if you've had radiotherapy, if you had this chemotherapy, you pick the pieces out and put them together to create a guideline for each of those people. And that is what we tend to do when you come through pediatric oncology. If your, your, your care has been more within another service, so for instance, if it's more on uh, uh, orthopedic or maybe predominantly orth uh, sort of uh, ophthalmologic if you're retinoblastoma, you may not have access to the, the, the same sort of thing, which is, which is why that education is there. And the problem is that when it comes to GPs, they just say, I mean, one of the classic quotes that came to me was, just tell us what we need to do and we'll do it. But that means that you actually have to have a GP because they haven't got enough time to go in and actually work all this stuff out as well because they're so busy looking after everybody else. And that's the problem is that it's, it's a slowly sort of, it's a slow process to actually understand and to educate that. 
And for something as incredibly rare as retinoblastoma, uh, which is still, I think, 24, 25 cases a year in Canada, yes, that's, that's an unbelievably rare, rare disease. For advocacy, you really need a celebrity. So for the BRCA2 mutation, you've got Angelina Jolie there. She's there up front and everywhere on film and TV and everything like this. Everybody knows BRCA2. Nobody knows RB. So that's the problem that you have. So, so getting somebody who can put that together is really, really important. And that what, that's what the long-term follow-up clinics that we'd love to have would be able to do. Thank you for that response. And I might also just bring us back to where we are today. And this is a research symposium and this is a research priority. And so it's also something we want to study and investigate is, you know, what would be the optimal type of um, guide or, or framework that we could give families to help <coughs> inform their follow-up. So that's a study that I hope someone takes on Monday. Um, any other questions to anyone in the room? Oh, Dr. Sheikh has a question. Thanks to the panel for a great talk. Um, Bruce, one of, I think one of the challenges is that these survivorship guidelines, you plug in the chemo you had, the surgery you had, the radiation you had, but you don't plug in the genetics you had. No. And so I don't think the survivorship guidelines capture the second cancer risk from, from the genetics. Um, whereas, because I think the survivorship clinics think, oh, that job's done by the cancer genetics clinic. And so one of the problem perhaps is this division of labor that needs to maybe meet in the middle. Um, and then I think a second challenge is, you know, everyone's been talking about the theme of doctors not, not knowing RB. Um, there's, there's about 100 times more family physicians in Canada than there are RB patients. And so 99 out of 100 GPs will never meet someone with RB. So we can't expect that. And then they don't have time to Google and, and read on something they won't see. We have to almost provide sort of just-in-time education. And so I'm just brainstorming here. But like CRAB seems to be positioned in an excellent place to perhaps provide that sort of just-in-time education. I'm wondering if there's a mini project where, where you go to CRAB, you enter your name, your doctor's name, and, and out comes a dear doctor letter. It looks as if it was sort of written specifically for this patient, specifically by one of us. Um, and and we, just, we just hand it and say, dear doctor, I have, I'm, I have an RB1 gene mutation. These are my risks. If I come with bone pain, please consider this, order this, refer to this. If I have abdominal pain, please consider this, uh, order this, refer to this uh, specialist. Mm -hmm. Just uh, because we, Brenda provides such a letter, I provide such a letter, but we do it for our individual patients. And, and of course, those letters go out of date, they get lost, um, they get misplaced. And, and you know, um, so that's just a brainstorming an idea that may be helpful, but also maybe updating the survivorship guidelines to include the genetic exposure. So. That would be absolutely fabulous, but they also need to be updated because what Ella had from when she was a kid and had that letter from Brenda is now <clears throat> however many years out of date, and I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> so I'm being very, very polite. But who knows how many years old that is and how much water has gone under the bridge from then and how much more we know about your particular mutation and your risks as well. And that's also one of the things is that these get, things get created and then they just stick for the next 25 years and they're not necessarily updated. So we also need to have a way of evergreening that as well. Helen, I think you have a question. Yeah, I just wanted to build off of that and also a comment I see online from Hiral that, you know, the, the question was, couldn't sick kids help me find a pediatrician that knows a little bit more about RB so I don't have to keep telling all the different ones. So you're right, Furkan, there's about a hundred times as many pediatricians, but what if we as an RB team went a little bit beyond and extended our RB teams to community medical members who are a little bit more specialty trained and can serve our our RB community. Is that a possibility or is that not the way the medical system works or do we change it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I mean, our, our paradigm is that we often share care. And when we try, and, and we obviously we have somebody who has a cancer diagnosis, then obviously their needs are very, very different from a kid who doesn't have a cancer diagnosis. And so therefore, especially when they're going out into a community and in, in, in particularly in the Maritimes where I practice, it's very, very diverse and we're very, very spread out. So we, we use our, our community pediatricians and ensure that every one of our patients pretty much has a link into a family, a sort of a, a, a community pediatrician who can actually help with that care as well. And one of the advantages of doing that is that they become familiar with that. So it's rather than 
the, all of a sudden they get delivered this patient at the end of treatment and they said, oh, we've done all this treatment and that's this patient and they don't know them because they've been involved with their care along the line, they have a relationship already. They understand what the treatments have been. They understand what the complications have been. And then they can help to take over that longer term general pediatric care. And so that's that's what we try to do. Um, as I say, the, the problem is resourcing across the whole of all the different provinces, all of which who have a different system and they have different resources and they have different funding issues and they have different paradigms of care. So Canada is not all equal and it's it's very frustrating. Thanks for that. I'm. Did you want to say something, Ashwin? Yeah, I mean, the two mics that are on. One okay, is sorry, we do have to wrap up because we are an hour behind. So maybe I'll leave time for two more quick comments if I may, and then we'll have to wrap up. I'm sorry. Do you want to go first, Ashwin? Because you. Okay, go ahead, Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. I love that. <laughs> that sounds like a challenge that we can't pass up when it comes from Brenda. It's it's like it's like you so you you start off by going mm, yes, <laughs> don't you? When Brenda comes up, you start with this no word, and it somehow turns into a yes, and there's no way of getting over that. Well, she's getting off of her volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> I, Brenda I doesn't have to volunteer. She's already in there. <laughs> I did a spin-off comment uh, similar to what uh, has been said right now. In other words, uh, there seems to be a common theme over here across groups. In other words, if, if all of you remember how hard it was to convince doctors of the diagnosis of leukocoria to start with, and that started the retinoblastoma diagnosis itself, that same convincing seems to require to be redone now as your adults. Now you can advocate for yourselves, but then your parents were advocating for you. I think that that, that somehow ties be between the follow-up and the early diagnosis groups and somehow to be able to better convince uh, physicians uh, and you know what's going on there. Why are we physicians not listening to you so much? as you'd like us to be. That's probably a question that can be solved across both the groups of early diagnosis and, um, and the follow-up theme, I don't know. Thank you for that comment. Um, I think we'll conclude the panels now. I do apologize for being so um, behind schedule, but it was a really rich discussion. And I thank all of the panelists from all four panels today.